Welcome to Lesson 38, which roughly covers pages 233 to 236 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the Web Browser module. The Web Browser module's open function can launch a new browser to a specified URL. So let's enter the following into the interactive shell. Uh, Web Browser dot open, and then pass it a string of a URL to open about automate the boring stuff.com. And you can see Python will launch a new browser, your operating system's default browser, whatever that's configured to, to the website that you passed it. Now, this is about the only thing that the web browser module can do, this open function, but even so, the open function does make some interesting things possible. For example, it's really tedious to go to some website and then have to copy uh, by pressing Control c some address and then opening a new tab and going to maps.google.com and then having to paste this into that field and then press enter just to bring up a map of that address. And we can take a few steps out of this process by writing a simple script that will automatically, automatically launch the browser to this address on the Google Maps site. So let's start up a new file editor window by clicking on File, New File. And let's see, we're going to need to import the web browser module for this, but let's think about what exactly we want this program to do. Now ideally it'd be nice on Windows if I could just hit Windows key R to bring up the run dialog and then type out map it to run the map it program. We'll just, let me just go ahead and save this as mapit.py. Uh, let's go to the my users slash al slash my python scripts folder that we set up in a previous lesson. I'll just save this as mapit.py. So it'd be nice if we could just run this program by hitting Windows key R, typing out map it, and then just pressing OK and then having having the Python script read the contents of the clipboard and opening up a web browser to the Google Maps page at that address. Alternatively, we can also have it so that when you're typing it out right here, you could type out the address that you want and these command line arguments would be read by the Mapit program and it would open up the Google Maps website to this address. So that'll use the command line arguments, which we went over in a previous lesson. Remember that the command line arguments means we need to import the sys module because the command line arguments are stored in a list variable because the command line arguments are stored in a list in the sys.argv variable. So if I ran something like map it dot pi 870 Valencia Street the argv variable would contain a value that looks something like this it would have map it and then 870 it's delimited by spaces so these command line arguments would all be separate the next string would be Valencia and the final string would be street so first let's have the R script check if command line arguments were passed. So since this is a list value, just like any other list value, we can call we can pass it to len the length function. And if we didn't call it with any of these command line arguments, the length of this list would just be 1. So we know that if there are command line arguments, this list will have a length of greater than 1. So we'll just say if the length of the sys.argv list is greater than 1, then we know command line arguments have been passed to it. So again, we have this list here, which is going to be inside of argv. What we want to do is take these strings right here, all the strings after the first one, and combine them into a single string, something that looks like this. And if you'll remember, this is exactly what the join method does for strings. So we could have a string with a single space in it and called join and then pass it that list argv except we don't want this first part here we want to get a slice that is create a new list with just these values so we'll have to have the square brackets and a colon and so the slice begins at index 1 not index 0 
but index one, so we'll have this right here, and we want the slice to continue to the end of the list. So that means we'll just leave the second number here, the second index blank. So what this slice essentially equals is this list value right here. So that slice is then passed to join, which joins all of it into a single string value with a single space in between them. So that's the string value we want for the address. Let's just store that in a variable named address. Now otherwise, if there were no command line arguments, then we're going to assume the user has it on the clipboard and that we should get the address from the text on the clipboard. So remember, anything dealing with the clipboard, we're going to have to import the Piper Clip module. And this is a third party module that you'll have to install separately, which we did in a previous lesson. Web browser and sys are modules that come with Python when you install it. So here, we just have address equals piperclip.paste. So this takes whatever text is on the clipboard and it returns it as a string, which we store into address. So by the time the program execution gets past this if-else statement, no matter what, the address variable has a string of the address we want to open up. So let's go ahead and launch that web browser. We'll have to figure out what address to pass it. So we're going to look at this. Uh, let me just copy this and paste it into a comment right here. That is a huge URL. Uh, you know, this part makes sense. Okay, google.com, and then we can see, oh, here's the address. And then this looks like some latitude and longitude coordinates, and then this data part, which is really confusing. Let's just check to see if this actually works. And we can get rid of it, and hopefully the Google website is smart enough to figure out what we actually want. And it does. It actually does reroute to that same address. You know, adding all of these pluses for spaces, we could do that, but let's see if the, the Google Maps website is smart enough where if we just enter spaces directly, if it can find our address, and it does, so that's great. That means we could just paste this address right here. So the URL that we have to go to would be this part, google.com slash maps, followed by the address. We don't even have to do anything special to it. We can just concatenate this string directly to the end of that URL. So let's go ahead and I'm going to press control C and copy that. So the website that we want to open up is going to be this website and then concatenate the address string to the end of that. And let me go ahead and save that. So this is nice, but it's currently not very convenient to call this script because even on Windows, when I press Window key R to bring this up, in order to run this program, I'm going to have to first run Python, which is here in Program Files slash Python 3.5, uh, python.exe, and then I'm going to have to pass it the full path of the Python script itself, which is in mypythonscripts.py, and then I'm going to have to type in the address, but this is way too much typing. That's not really that convenient. What I want is just to be able to say map it and then type in the address. So in a previous lesson, we learned how to create batch files on Windows which would make it really easy to run a Python script. And this applies to Windows only, but in the course notes there are steps on how to do something like this on Mac and Linux as well. So let's create a batch file that will run our mapit.py program. So I'll just create a new file, and here I'm just going to run py.exe, and then pass it the path of the script. And then this percent star syntax just to pass, just to forward any command line arguments to the script. I'll make sure I set this to all files, and I just save this as mapit.bat. So this is a batch file that is easier to call, and the batch file will in turn call mapit.py. So now that I have that, I'm all set up. All I have to do is hit Windows key R, type mapit. And then type out my address, and I can bring up a map. Or you could go to a website 
that has a whole bunch of business addresses on it. And a lot of these websites will have links to map websites right there, but if they don't, you could easily just highlight the address, press copy, or if somebody sent you an address in an email or something like that, just copy it, then press Windows key R, and then just type map it. And that'll instantly bring up a browser window with the address already plugged in. So while some of the programs you write will perform huge tasks that save you hours, it can be just as satisfying to use a program that conveniently saves you a few seconds each time you perform a common task, such as getting a map of an address. So to recap, Python comes with a web browser module, which has a function called open, which you can pass a string to open up a web browser. What we did in this example was create a small program that will just read an address off of the clipboard or from the command line arguments, and then open that to the Google Maps website with the address already plugged in. Welcome to lesson 38, which roughly covers pages 233 to 236 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the web browser module. The web browser module's open function can launch a new browser to a specified URL. So let's enter the following into the interactive shell. Uh, web browser open, and then pass it a string of a URL to open. About automate the boring stuff.com. And you can see Python will launch a new browser, your operating system's default browser, whatever that's configured to, to the website that you passed it. Now, this is about the only thing that the web browser module can do, this open function, but even so, the open function does make some interesting things possible. For example, it's really tedious to go to some website and then have to copy uh, by pressing Control c some address and then opening a new tab and going to maps.google.com and then having to paste this into that field and then press enter just to bring up a map of that address. Now we can take a few steps out of this process by writing a simple script that will automatically, automatically launch the browser to this address on the Google Maps site. So let's start up a new file editor window by clicking on File, New File. And let's see, we're going to need to import the web browser module for this, but let's think about what exactly we want this program to do. Now ideally it'd be nice on Windows if I could just hit Windows key R to bring up the run dialog and then type out map it to run the map it program. We'll just, let me just go ahead and save this as map it.py. Uh, let's go to the my users slash al slash my Python scripts folder that we set up in a previous lesson. I'll just save this as map it.py. So it'd be nice if we could just run this program by hitting Windows key R, typing out map it, and then just pressing OK and then having, having the Python script read the contents of the clipboard and opening up a web browser to the Google Maps page at that address. Alternatively, we can also have it so that when you're typing it out right here, you could type out the address that you want and these command line arguments would be read by the map it program and it would open up the Google Maps website to this address. So that'll use the command line arguments, which we went over in a previous lesson. Remember that the command line arguments means we need to import the sys module because the command line arguments are stored in a list variable. Because the command line arguments are stored in a list in the sys.argv variable. So if I ran something like map it dot pi 870 Valencia Street. The argv variable would contain a value that looks something like this. It would have map it and then 870. It's delimited by spaces, so these command line arguments would all be separate. The next string would be Valencia and the final string would be street. So first, let's have the, our script check if command line arguments were passed. So since this is a list value, just like any other list value, we can call we can pass it to len the length function. And if we didn't call it with any of these command line arguments, the length of this list would just be 1. 
So we know that if there are command line arguments, this list will have a length of greater than one. So we'll just say if the length of the sys.argv list is greater than one, then we know command line arguments have been passed to it. So again, we have this list here, which is going to be inside of argv. What we want to do is take these strings right here, all the strings after the first one, and combine them into a single string, something that looks like this. And if you'll remember, this is exactly what the join method does for strings. So we could have a string with a single space in it and called join, and then pass it that list, argv. Except we don't want this first part here. We want to get a slice, that is, create a new list with just these values. So we'll have to have the square brackets and a colon. And so the slice begins at index 1, not index 0 index 1, so we'll have this right here, and we want the slice to continue to the end of the list. So that means we'll just leave the second number here, the second index blank. So what this slice essentially equals is this list value right here. So that slice is then passed to join, which joins all of it into a single string value with a single space in between them. So that's the string value we want for the address. Let's just store that in a variable named address. Now otherwise, if there were no command line arguments, then we're going to assume the user has it on the clipboard and that we should get the address from the text on the clipboard. So remember, anything dealing with the clipboard, we're going to have to import the Piper Clip module. And this is a third party module that you'll have to install separately, which we did in a previous lesson. Web browser and sys are modules that come with Python when you install it. So here, we just have address equals piperclip.paste. So this takes whatever text is on the clipboard and it returns it as a string, which we store into address. So by the time the program execution gets past this if-else statement, no matter what, the address variable has a string of the address we want to open up. So let's go ahead and launch that web browser. We'll have to figure out what address to pass it. So we're going to look at this uh, let me just copy this and paste it into a comment right here. That is a huge URL. Uh, you know, this part makes sense. Okay, google.com, and then we can see, oh, here's the address. And then this looks like some latitude and longitude coordinates, and then this data part, which is really confusing. Let's just check to see if this actually works. And we can get rid of it, and hopefully the Google website is smart enough to figure out what we actually want. And it does. It actually does reroute to that same address. You know, adding all of these pluses for spaces, we could do that. But let's see if the, the Google Maps website is smart enough where if we just enter spaces directly, if it can find our address. And it does. So that's great. That means we could just paste this address right here. So the URL that we have to go to would be this part, google.com slash maps, followed by the address. We don't even have to do anything special to it. We can just concatenate this string directly to the end of that URL. So let's go ahead and I'm going to press control C and copy that. So the website that we want to open up is going to be this website and then concatenate the address string to the end of that. And let me go ahead and save that. So this is nice, but it's currently not very convenient to call this script because even on Windows, when I press window key R to bring this up, in order to run this program, I'm going to have to first run Python, which is here in program files slash Python 3.5, uh, python.exe, and then I'm going to have to pass it the full path of the Python script itself, which is in my Python scripts dot that, and then I'm gonna have to type in the address. But this is way too much typing. That's not really that convenient. What I want is just to be able to say map it, and then type in the address. So in a previous lesson, we learned how to create batch files on Windows, which would make it really easy to run a Python script. 
And this applies to Windows only, but in the course notes, there are steps on how to do something like this on Mac and Linux as well. So let's create a batch file that will run our mapit.py program. So I'll just create a new file. And here I'm just going to run py.exe and then pass it the path of the script. And then this percent star syntax just to pass, just to forward any command line arguments to the script. I'll make sure I set this to all files and I just save this as mapit.bat. So this is a batch file that is easier to call and the batch file will in turn call mapit.py. So now that I have that, I'm all set up. All I have to do is hit Windows key R, type map it, and then type out my address, and I can bring up a map. Or you could go to a website that has a whole bunch of business addresses on it. And a lot of these websites will have links to map websites right there, but if they don't, you could easily just Highlight the address, press copy, or if somebody sent you an address in an email or something like that, just copy it, then press Windows key R, and then just type map it. And that'll instantly bring up a browser window with the address already plugged in. So while some of the programs you write will perform huge tasks that save you hours, it can be just as satisfying to use a program that conveniently saves you a few seconds each time you perform a common task, such as getting a map of an address. So to recap, Python comes with a web browser module, which has a function called open, which you can pass a string to open up a web browser. What we did in this example was create a small program that will just read an address off of the clipboard or from the command line arguments, and then open that to the Google Maps website with the address already plugged in. Welcome to Lesson 39, which roughly covers pages 237 to 240 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to download files from the web. The request module lets you easily download files from the web without having to worry about complicated issues such as network errors, connection problems, and data compression. Now, the request module doesn't come with Python. It's a third-party module, so you'll have to install it on your own first. The course notes and Appendix A have additional details on how to install third-party modules. Now, after installing the module, do a simple test to make sure the request module is installed uh, correctly. Try to import the request module, and if no error messages show up, then the request module has been successfully installed. To download a file, call it requests.get and pass it the, a string of the URL of the file to download. Here at automatetheboringstuff.com slash file slash rj.txt, I have a text file of the complete text of the Romeo and Juliet play by William Shakespeare. So let's go ahead and just copy this by pressing Control C and then pressing Control V to paste it into idle. And the get function returns a response object, which I'll store in a variable named res. This response object contains the response that the web server gave you for this request. You can tell that the request for the web page succeeded by checking the status code attribute of the response object. You may already be familiar with the 404 status code for file not found. The 200 status code means everything went okay. So if the request succeeded, the downloaded web page is stored as a string in the response object's text variable. Now this variable holds a large string of the entire play. If we pass this to len, you can see that this string has 174,000 characters in it. So let's just print out, say, the first 500 characters using a slice. Now a simpler way to check for success is to call the raise for status method on the response object. Now this will raise an exception if there was an error downloading the file, and do nothing if the download succeeded. So when I call it here, nothing happens because it was just fine. But let's say I had a request.get call to a file that didn't exist. I'm just going to type some random characters here. This is a completely random, non-existing file. 
I can then call raise for status on this response object and it will raise an exception. You can see it gives you details about what went wrong right here. It's giving us that 404 not found error. So the raise for status method is a good way to ensure that the program halts if, the, if a bad download occurs. This is a good thing. You want your program to stop as soon as some unexpected error happens. If a failed download isn't a deal breaker for your program, you can wrap the raise for status line inside of a try and accept statement to handle this error case without crashing. And from here, you can save the web page to a file on your hard drive with the standard open function. There are some slight differences though. First, you must open the file in write binary mode by passing the string wb as the second argument to open. So I'll just create a file object here and store it in play file. Call open. We'll save it to a file called romeoandjuliet.txt and open it in write binary mode by passing wb. Even if the page is in plain text, such as the Romeo and Juliet text you downloaded earlier, you need to write binary data instead of text data in order to maintain the Unicode encoding of the text. Unicode is beyond the scope of this course, but there's an excellent explanation of Python and Unicode at bit.ly slash unipane. The steps I'm showing you here work for any file that you download from the web using requests. Now, to write the web page to a file, you can use a for loop with the response object's iter content method. So I'll just say for chunk in res iter content. And the iter content method returns chunks of the content on each iteration through the loop. Each chunk is of the bytes data type, and you get to specify how many bytes each chunk will contain. Uh, let's just pass 100,000. 100,000 bytes per iteration through this loop is pretty good. So here we just call playfile.write and then write out the chunk. So each chunk is just a piece of that downloaded file in the response object. And the write method will return an integer of how many bytes it wrote to this file. So 100,000 on the first iteration through this loop, and on the second iteration, it wrote the remaining 74,000 bytes to the file. Then we can just call playfile.close. So the file romeoandjuliet.txt will now exist in the current working directory on your computer. Note that the file name on the website was rj.txt, but the file on your hard drive has a different name because we just specified a different name right here, the open function. The request module simply handles downloading the contents of web pages. Once the page is downloaded, it is simply data in your program, like any other variable. And that's all there is to the request module for doing simple downloading. You can learn about the other features in the request modules from the website request.readthedocs.org. And one last bit, the request module is good for downloading files or web pages when you have the exact URL to download. But if you have to log into a website first or figuring out the URL is a complicated process, using requests might not be the best way to do it. In the next lesson, we'll learn about Selenium, which lets your Python scripts control the web browser directly. To recap, the request module is a third party module for downloading web pages and files. Request.get returns a response object. The raise for status response method will raise an exception if the download failed for some reason. And you can save a downloaded file to your hard drive with calls to the iter content method. Welcome to lesson 39, which roughly covers pages 237 to 240 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to download files from the web. The request module lets you easily download files from the web without having to worry about complicated issues such as network errors, connection problems, and data compression. Now the request module doesn't come with Python, it's a third-party module, so you'll have to install it on your own first. The course notes and Appendix A have additional details on how to install third-party modules. Now after installing the module, do a simple test to make sure the request module is installed uh, correctly. Try to import the request module, and if no error messages show up, then the request module has been successfully installed. To download a file, call requests.get and pass it the, a string of the URL of the file to download. 
Here at automatetheboringstuff.com slash file slash rj.txt, I have a text file of the complete text of the Romeo and Juliet play by William Shakespeare. So let's go ahead and just copy this by pressing Control C and then pressing Control V to paste it into idle. And the get function returns a response object, which I'll store in a variable named res. This response object contains the response that the web server gave you for this request. You can tell that the request for the web page succeeded by checking the status code attribute of the response object. You may already be familiar with the 404 status code for file not found. The 200 status code means everything went okay. So if the request succeeded, the downloaded web page is stored as a string in the response object's text variable. Now this variable holds a large string of the entire play. If we pass this to len, you can see that this string has 174,000 characters in it. So let's just print out, say, the first 500 characters using a slice. Now a simpler way to check for success is to call the raise for status method on the response object. Now this will raise an exception if there was an error downloading the file and do nothing if the download succeeded. So when I call it here, nothing happens because it was just fine. But let's say I had a request.get call to a file that didn't exist. I'm just going to type some random characters here. This is a completely random, non-existing file. I can then call raise for status on this response object, and it will raise an exception. You can see it gives you details about what went wrong right here. It's giving us that 404 not found error. So the raise for status method is a good way to ensure that the program halts if, the, if a bad download occurs. This is a good thing. You want your program to stop as soon as some unexpected error happens. If a failed download isn't a deal breaker for your program, you can wrap the raise for status line inside of a try and accept statement to handle this error case without crashing. And from here, you can save the web page to a file on your hard drive with the standard open function. There are some slight differences though. First, you must open the file in write binary mode by passing the string wb as the second argument to open. So I'll just create a file object here and store it in play file. Call open. We'll save it to a file called romeoandjuliet.txt and open it in write binary mode by passing wb. Even if the page is in plain text, such as the Romeo and Juliet text you downloaded earlier, you need to write binary data instead of text data in order to maintain the Unicode encoding of the text. Unicode is beyond the scope of this course, but there's an excellent explanation of Python and Unicode at bit.ly slash unipane. The steps I'm showing you here work for any file that you download from the web using requests. Now, to write the web page to a file, you can use a for loop with the response object's iter content method. So I'll just say for chunk in res iter content. And the iter content method returns chunks of the content on each iteration through the loop. Each chunk is of the bytes data type, and you get to specify how many bytes each chunk will contain. Uh, let's just pass 100,000. 100,000 bytes per iteration through this loop is pretty good. So here we just call playfile.write and then write out the chunk. So each chunk is just a piece of that downloaded file in the response object. And the write method will return an integer of how many bytes it wrote to this file. So 100,000 on the first iteration through this loop, and on the second iteration, it wrote the remaining 74,000 bytes to the file. Then we can just call playfile.close. So the file romeoandjuliet.txt will now exist in the current working directory on your computer. Note that the file name on the website was rj.txt, but the file on your hard drive has a different name because we just specified a different name right here, the open function. The request module simply handles downloading the contents of web pages. Once the page is downloaded, it is simply data in your program, like any other variable. And that's all there is to the request module for doing simple downloading. You can learn about the other features in the request modules 
from the website requests.readthedocs.org. And one last bit, the request module is good for downloading files or web pages when you have the exact URL to download. But if you have to log into a website first or figuring out the URL is a complicated process, using requests might not be the best way to do it. In the next lesson, we'll learn about Selenium, which lets your Python scripts control the web browser directly. To recap, the request module is a third-party module for downloading web pages and files. Request.get returns a response object. The raise for status response method will raise an exception if the download failed for some reason. And you can save a downloaded file to your hard drive with calls to the iter content method. Welcome to Lesson 40, which roughly covers pages 240 to 248 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we'll learn how to write programs that pull information off of web pages. This is known as web scraping. It'll help if you know HTML and CSS selectors already. There are links to tutorials for these in the course notes, but there's also a way that you can get the browser to figure out the CSS selector for you, and we'll go over that in this lesson. When your browser downloads a web page, it's downloading a plain text file formatted as HTML. HTML sounds a bit cryptic. It stands for Hypertext Markup Language. Yeah, I'm guessing that didn't clarify things. Basically, HTML is the text that tells the browser how to make the web page look. You can see the HTML for any web page by pressing Ctrl U in your browser or right clicking the page and selecting View Source. HTML is mostly text with these angle bracket bracketed things called HTML elements. Bring up the developer tools in your web browser. On Chrome and Firefox, this is done by pressing F12. You can hover over the HTML in the Elements pane, and it'll point out what part of the page this HTML is responsible for. Alternatively, you can right-click on a part of the page and select Inspect Element, and that'll bring up the HTML element for that piece of the page that you clicked on. And this will be useful when we need to pull information off of a website. Now the request module handles downloading the web page itself, but that just gets us this huge string of text of the page's HTML. In order to locate the text we need inside this huge string, we need to parse the HTML. The third-party module Beautiful Soup makes this easy. And Beautiful Soup is a third-party module, so you have to install it by running pip install Beautiful Soup 4. To see if the install worked, type import bs4, and if there are no error messages, then the module has been installed successfully. Notice that even though the name of the module is Beautiful Soup, uh, the, module, the name that you use to import it is bs4. This stands for the fourth version of Beautiful Soup. So let's work through an example of web scraping the price information off of an Amazon page. So we want our Python script to download this web page and then find this price information. So I'm going to first copy this URL, and we've imported the beautiful soup module, but we'll also need to import requests, which we covered in the last lesson, and this will handle the actual downloading. And we'll call the raise for status method just to make sure everything worked. And nothing happened, so that means there were no problems. And no exceptions were raised by this function, so that means there were no problems downloading this website. And now we'll have to call the BS4 module's beautiful soup function and pass it the HTML text that we've downloaded. This will be in res.text. And this will return a beautiful soup object, so let's just save that in a variable named soup. Oh, whoops. Be sure to spell beautiful soup correctly. Now a warning will show up because there have been some additions to the beautiful soup module, and in fact it can parse HTML but also several other different things. So if we It'll assume that we do want to parse HTML when we call this beautiful soup function. Now this warning won't crash our program or anything, it just looks really ugly. So to hide this, we would just have to pass HTML.parser 
as the second argument. And this will tell beautiful soup, yes, we do want to pass, we do want to parse HTML. You could also not pass this and just simply ignore this ugly warning. So a warning is not an exception in Python. So this soup object that we have is now ready to find HTML elements in the web page that we downloaded. The main way we do this is with the select method, and we pass it a string of the CSS selector for the element or elements that we want to look at. Now CSS selector syntax, if you've ever done CSS before, you've already used CSS selectors. They're kind of like regular expression syntax, but CSS selectors answer the question of how do I specify a particular part of the HTML document that I want to look at? And you could look at the HTML yourself and figure it out if you've already learned this syntax, or you can have the browser figure it out for you. So let's just right click on this price information right here and select inspect element. And so this will show you that this span element is the HTML element that contains that price text, that $22.86. So to get a CSS selector for this span element, you can right click on the element and select copy CSS path. If you use browsers other than Chrome, this might be copy CSS selector or copy unique selector or something like that. But just copy it and that'll be copied to the clipboard and then we'll paste it into our code. And so this is the address of that span element that contains the price. And what select does is it returns a list of all these element objects for all the matching elements. And since this is a unique selector that we gave, there will only be one element in this list. So let's save this to a variable called elems. So elems is just a list. It'll contain one element object. So we'll just use the zero index to get that element. And each of these element objects, just like the requests' uh, response objects, has a member variable called text and text just holds a string value of the text inside that HTML, HTML element. You can see right here, it has a bunch of new lines and the price inside of this. We can see this right here. There's a bunch of tab characters and new lines and just white space characters. So that's kind of messy. Let's just, um, let's call this strip string method. We've seen that before. And this will return a new string without all of this white space characters on either side of the string and that returns $22.86. So we've just written Python code that downloads a website and finds information for us. Let's put all of this together inside of a single program. I'm gonna click on File, New File, and let's take this from the top. So we're gonna to have to import VS4 and also requests, and let's create a function called getAmazonPrice, and we just pass this a string of the product's URL. And this function will return the price of the product. So when we call this later on, say get Amazon price, we pass it the URL of the product we want. And this will return some price information. I'll store that in a price variable. And then we can do whatever we want with that price information. I'll just print it out to the screen. So the price is and use string concatenation to just concatenate this and then print it out. So we want this function to return a string of the price. That's pretty simple. That's basically all the steps that we've done already. So let's put them all into this function. So first, we use request to download that page. Then we'll just call raise for status. So if there was some sort of problem downloading this, it'll raise an exception in Crasher program. Next, we want to create a soup object by calling the beautiful soup function and passing it the HTML text of that web page we've downloaded. That's, that'll be in the text variable of the response object. And then we'll call the select method. We'll just pass it this CSS selector, which we originally got just from the web page by right-clicking on that price, selecting inspect element, then right-clicking on the element and getting the CSS path for it. This will return a list of matching elements for that CSS selector. We only want the first one in there, and 
that element object will also, just like how response objects happen to also have a member variable called text that contains their content, element objects also have a variable called text, coincidentally, that contains the text inside that HTML element, and it had a lot of white space on either side of it, so let's just call the strip string method on the string inside of text. And so that'll give us that $22 string. So we want our function to just return that. So let's go ahead and test this out. Oh, wait, I almost forgot. This beautiful soup function, just to, get, just to make sure that that ugly warning message doesn't show up, we'll just pass html.parser to it. All right, so let's test this out. I'm gonna save this as example.py, and I'll press F5 to run it. And that worked. So behind the scenes of this really simple print function call that just displays this text, our program went to the Amazon website, downloaded the web page, it parsed the HTML of that web page looking for the price, and then that function returned this price, which we then just passed it along to print to print out, oh, the price of that is $22.86. Now just imagine if you had a hundred things that you needed to check the price on every day just to see if they changed or not. If you did that by hand, you would have to go through every single product on this website over and over, writing down all the prices. That would be a bit of a pain, but now we have a function, we just pass it the URLs, and we could just run this program to download all these hundreds or even thousands of product prices and just look at the prices there. So if we had hundreds or thousands of product URLs, we would just call get Amazon price for each of them and that would return the price for us. We wouldn't have to touch the web browser ourselves at all. Now, this code won't work on every Amazon page. It's very dependent on exactly how Amazon format, formats the HTML of their web pages. If they ever update their web page or even just have a different kinds of products with different kinds of product web pages, sometimes this code might fail. We'd have to figure out the new CSS selector for that new web page. So you can try adding a try and accept block to this code to gracefully handle any errors that come up, or maybe even just put a debugger breakpoint to see exactly how this failed. But even still, this code will mostly work. So now go to some other websites and try web scraping. I really recommend the National Weather Service at weather.gov or the webcomic XKCD. You could write some program that would figure out the HTML for this image right here and then use request to download this image and then start parsing for this link information to figure out the URL of the previous comic and then just repeat that and that way you can repeatedly download all of the images off of this website. So to recap, web pages are plain text files formatted as HTML and HTML can be parsed with the beautiful soup module. Beautiful soup is imported with the name BS4. You'll have import BS4 as your code. So you can pass the string with the HTML to the bs4.beautifulsoup function to get a soup object. And the soup object has a select method that can be passed a string of the CSS selector for an HTML element. Now you can figure out the CSS selector string yourself if you know the selector string syntax, but an easier way to do it is just use the browser's developer tools by right-clicking an element and selecting copy CSS path. And the select method will return a list of matching element objects. Each of these element objects has a text variable with a string of the, HT of the element's HTML. Each element object has a text variable with a string of that element's HTML. Welcome to Lesson 40, which roughly covers pages 240 to 248 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we'll learn how to write programs that pull information off of web pages. This is known as web scraping. It'll help if you know HTML and CSS selectors already. There are links to tutorials for these in the course notes, but there's also a way that you can get the browser to figure out the CSS selector for you, and we'll go over that in this lesson. When your browser downloads a web page, it's downloading a plain text file formatted as HTML. HTML sounds a bit cryptic. It stands for Hypertext Markup Language. Yeah, I'm guessing that didn't clarify things. Basically, HTML is the text that tells the browser how to make the web page look. 
You can see the HTML for any web page by pressing Ctrl U in your browser or right clicking the page and selecting View Source. HTML is mostly text with these angle bracket bracketed things called HTML elements. Bring up the developer tools in your web browser. On Chrome and Firefox, this is done by pressing F12. You can hover over the HTML in the Elements pane, and it'll point out what part of the page this HTML is responsible for. Alternatively, you can right-click on a part of the page and select Inspect Element, and that'll bring up the HTML element for that piece of the page that you clicked on. And this will be useful when we need to pull information off of a website. Now the request module handles downloading the web page itself, but that just gets us this huge string of text of the page's HTML. In order to locate the text we need inside this huge string, we need to parse the HTML. The third-party module Beautiful Soup makes this easy. And Beautiful Soup is a third-party module, so you have to install it by running pip install Beautiful Soup 4. To see if the install worked, type import bs4, and if there are no error messages, then the module has been installed successfully. Notice that even though the name of the module is Beautiful Soup, uh, the module, the name that you use to import it is bs4. This stands for the fourth version of Beautiful Soup. So let's work through an example of web scraping the price information off of an Amazon page. So we want our Python script to download this web page and then find this price information. So I'm going to first copy this URL, and we've imported the beautiful soup module, but we'll also need to import requests, which we covered in the last lesson, and this will handle the actual downloading. And we'll call the raise for status method just to make sure everything worked. And nothing happened, so that means there were no problems. And no exceptions were raised by this function, so that means there were no problems downloading this website. And now we'll have to call the BS4 module's beautiful soup function and pass it the HTML text that we've downloaded. This will be in res.text. And this will return a beautiful soup object, so let's just save that in a variable named soup. Oh, whoops. Be sure to spell beautiful soup correctly. Now a warning will show up because there have been some additions to the beautiful soup module, and in fact it can parse HTML but also several other different things. So if we It'll assume that we do want to parse HTML when we call this beautiful soup function. Now this warning won't crash our program or anything, it just looks really ugly. So to hide this, we would just have to pass html.parser as the second argument. And this will tell beautiful soup, yes, we do want to pass, we do want to parse HTML. You could also not pass this and just simply ignore this ugly warning. So a warning is not an exception in Python. So this soup object that we have is now ready to find HTML elements in the web page that we downloaded. The main way we do this is with the select method, and we pass it a string of the CSS selector for the element or elements that we want to look at. Now CSS selector syntax, if you've ever done CSS before, you've already used CSS selectors. They're kind of like regular expression syntax, but CSS selectors answer the question of how do I specify a particular part of the HTML document that I want to look at? And you could look at the HTML yourself and figure it out if you've already learned this syntax, or you can have the browser figure it out for you. So let's just right click on this price information right here and select inspect element. And so this will show you that this span element is the HTML element that contains that price text, that $22.86. So to get a CSS selector for this span element, you can right click on the element and select copy CSS path. If you use browsers other than Chrome, this might be copy CSS selector or copy unique selector or something like that. 
but just copy it and that'll be copied to the clipboard and then we'll paste it into our code. And so this is the address of that span element that contains the price. And what select does is it returns a list of all these element objects for all the matching elements. And since this is a unique selector that we gave, there will only be one element in this list. So let's save this to a variable called elems. So elems is just a list. It'll contain one element object. So we'll just use the zero index to get that element. And each of these element objects, just like the requests' uh, response objects, has a member variable called text. And text just holds a string value of the text inside that HTML, HTML element. You can see right here, it has a bunch of new lines and the price inside of this. You can see this right here. There's a bunch of tab characters and new lines and just white space characters. So that's kind of messy. Let's just, um, let's call this strip string method. We've seen that before. And this will return a new string without all of this white space characters on either side of the string. And that returns $22.86. So we've just written Python code that downloads a website and finds information for us. Let's put all of this together inside of a single program. I'm going to click on File, New File, and let's take this from the top. So we're going to have to import VS4 and also requests. And let's create a function called get Amazon price. And we just pass this a string of the product's URL. And this function will return the price of the product. So when we call this later on, say get Amazon price, we pass it the URL of the product we want. And this will return some price information. I'll store that in a price variable. And then we can do whatever we want with that price information. I'll just print it out to the screen. So the price is, and use string concatenation, just concatenate this and then print it out. So we want this function to return a string of the price. That's pretty simple. That's basically all the steps that we've done already. So let's put them all into this function. So first we use requests to download that page. And we'll just call raise for status. So if there was some sort of problem downloading this, it'll raise an exception and crash our program. Next, we want to create a soup object by calling the beautiful soup function and passing it the HTML text of that web page we've downloaded. That's, that'll be in the text variable of the response object. And then we'll call the select method. We'll just pass it this CSS selector, which we originally got just from the web page by right clicking on that price, selecting inspect element, then right clicking on the element and getting the CSS path for it. This will return a list of matching elements for that CSS selector. We only want the first one in there and that element object will also, just like how response objects happen to also have a member variable called text that contains their content. Element objects also have a variable called text, coincidentally, that contains the text inside that HTML element. And it had a lot of white space on either side of it. So let's just call the strip string method on the string inside of text. And so that'll give us that $22 string. So we want our function to just return that. So let's go ahead and test this out. Oh, wait, I almost forgot. This beautiful soup function, just to, get, just to make sure that that ugly warning message doesn't show up, we'll just pass html.parser to it. All right, so let's test this out. I'm gonna save this as example.py, and I'll press F5 to run it. And that worked. So behind the scenes of this really simple print function call that just displays this text, our program went to the Amazon website, downloaded the web page, it parsed the HTML of that web page looking for the price, and then that function returned this price, which we then just passed it along to print to print out, oh, the price of that is $22.86. Now just imagine if you had a hundred things that you needed to check the price on every day just to see if they changed or not. If you did that by hand, you would have to go through every single product 
on this website over and over writing down all the prices. That would be a bit of a pain, but now we have a function that we just pass it the URLs and we could just run this program to download all these hundreds or even thousands of product prices and just look at the prices there. So if we had hundreds or thousands of product URLs, we would just call get Amazon price for each of them and that would return the price for us. We wouldn't have to touch the web browser ourselves at all. Now, this code won't work on every Amazon page. It's very dependent on exactly how Amazon format, formats the HTML of their web pages. If they ever update their web page or even just have a different kinds of products with different kinds of product web pages, sometimes this code might fail. Well, you'd have to figure out the new CSS selector for that new web page. So you can try adding a try and accept block to this code to gracefully handle any errors that come up, or maybe even just put a debugger breakpoint to see exactly how this failed. But even still, this code will mostly work. So now go to some other websites and try web scraping. I really recommend the National Weather Service at weather.gov or the webcomic XKCD. You could write some program that would figure out the HTML for this image right here and then use request to download this image and then start parsing for this link information to figure out the URL of the previous comic and then just repeat that and that way you can repeatedly download all of the images off of this website. So to recap, web pages are plain text files formatted as HTML and HTML can be parsed with the beautiful soup module. Beautiful soup is imported with the name BS4. You'll have import BS4 as your code. So you can pass the string with the HTML to the BS4.beautifulSoup function to get a soup object. And the soup object has a select method that can be passed a string of the CSS selector for an HTML element. Now you can figure out the CSS selector string yourself if you know the selector string syntax, but an easier way to do it is just use the browser's developer tools by right-clicking an element and selecting copy CSS path. And the select method will return a list of matching element objects. Each of these element objects has a text variable with a string of the, HT of the element's HTML. Each element object has a text variable with a string of that element's HTML. Welcome to lesson 41, which roughly covers pages 256 to 261 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In the previous two lessons, you learned how to download web pages and parse their HTML. This is fine if you just need the static text from a URL, but sometimes the web pages you want to access will require you to log in or they rely on JavaScript in order to work properly. This isn't something you can easily do by just downloading a URL. The Selenium module will launch a web browser that you can programmatically control from your Python program. You can call functions that will find HTML in the browser or fill out forms and login fields and click submit buttons. But because it launches a web browser, it's a bit slower and hard to run in the background if, say, you just need to download some files from the web. Selenium is a third-party module that you can install by running pip install selenium. Consult the course notes or appendix A of the Automate book for instructions on installing it. For this lesson, you'll need the Firefox web browser installed. This will be the browser that you control. If you don't already have Firefox, you can download it for free from getfirefox.com. Importing the modules for Selenium is slightly tricky. Instead of import Selenium, you'll need to run from Selenium import WebDriver. And the exact reason why the Selenium module is set up this way is kind of beyond the scope of this lesson. Just remember that you have to import it as from Selenium import WebDriver. And after that, you can launch the Firefox browser with Selenium by calling the webdriver.firefox function. And this will return a browser object, which we'll store here in this variable called browser. But notice, once I run this instruction, a new Firefox window has been launched. I'll just set this off to the side. And you can now control this by calling methods on this browser object, the most basic of which is the get method, which will just send this browser to a URL. So I'll just pass it the string automatetheboringstuff.com. 
and you can see my Python code is controlling this browser. So everything that a web browser does, Selenium is basically simulating. Now let's use CSS selectors to find an element on this page. Say I wanted to click on this link right here for the chapter zero link. I'm just going to use the trick of right clicking on it and selecting inspect element. And here I'll right click here to get a unique CSS selector by clicking on copy unique selector. So this is a selector string, just like the kind that we used in Beautiful Soup. So what I'm gonna do to get this element is I will call browsers find element by CSS selector, which is kind of a long name for this method, but I'll just pass it that CSS selector. And now you can see I have an, a web element object stored in the elem variable. And so once I have this element object, which represents a single element on this web page, I can then just call its click method, and that will simulate clicking on that link, on that element in the web browser. So if this element was a link, or if it was a checkbox, or if it was a submit button, you can simulate clicking on it. Now you can also specify instead of a unique CSS selector, a more general CSS selector in, that will match multiple elements. And using that, we can then call the find elements plural by CSS selector. And say if I just wanted to get all of the paragraph elements from that HTML page, you can see that this method returns a list of these element objects. Here I have 109 matching paragraph elements from that page. Selenium has several different methods for getting web elements from the web page. The ones that you'll most often use are find element by CSS selector and find elements by CSS selector, but you can also find elements by class name, by ID, link text, uh, the name or the tag name. All of these methods have a singular element form that will just return the first matching element, or find elements, plural, which will return every matching element that it finds. And there's more documentation on these in the Automate book. So we know how to click on things. Let's see how we can type into a web page as well. I'm just going to click on this link right here, and here we can find a search field for the automatetheboringstuff.com website. So I'm just going to right click on this to find, its CS to find a CSS selector that matches this. So I'll just copy unique selector. So here I'll just have to get a, an element for that search field by calling the find element by CSS selector. And now that I have this element object, I can then call its send keys method. And then I can pass it any string which will then be typed into that field. So if this was a search bar like this is, or if it was a username or a password field, you could type in any text you want into it. So in a lot of HTML forms, I would have to find the submit button and then get an element object for that and then call its click method. But Selenium helps us out with HTML forms. I can just take this search fields form and call submit, and Selenium will automatically find the HTML form associated with this uh, text field and then invoke its submit action. So I don't actually have to call click on anything. And you can see I've just done a search for Zophie, which is the name of my cat who features prominently in all of these chapter 17 pictures. So we've been interacting with the web pages in this browser, but using the browser objects method, you can also uh, control the browser itself. If I wanted to press the back button on the browser, I could just call the back function same thing with forward, or if I wanted to hit the refresh or reload button, I could just call the refresh method. And once I'm done with everything and I want to close the browser, I can just call the quit method. And that will immediately make the browser that Selenium launched disappear.
So we've seen how Selenium can be used to interact with the browser's web pages and interact with the browser itself. Let's just bring up another window. Now let's take a look at how your Python scripts can use Selenium to read the content of the web pages. First, we'll have to get an element object for the part of the web page that we want to read. Let's say, let's just grab this one right here. I'm going to inspect element, copy unique selector. Oh, whoops. And all web elements have a text member variable that contains a string of the text inside of that element. If you want the entire text for the website, the easiest thing to do is probably just grab the HTML or body element, which should contain the entire web page. If we take a look at the source by pressing Control U, you can see that the HTML element is the first element for the entire web page. So that'll contain everything in the web page. So Selenium can do much more beyond the functions described here, but this is the basics of it. Going to websites, finding elements that we want to click on, or typing text into fields and submitting forms, that's what most web browsing is. And now we have a way to write Python scripts that can do all of these actions automatically. But if you want to learn more about Selenium, you can read the full documentation at selenium-python.readthedocs.org or read the rest of chapter 11 of Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. Now to recap, to import Selenium, you need to run from Selenium import WebDriver. Just running import Selenium doesn't work. And to open the browser, run webdriver.firefox. This will actually launch the Firefox web browser, and you'll see it appear on your screen. The browser's get method can be used to send it to a particular website, and the find element or find elements by CSS selector method is the main way that you'll use to grab element objects representing parts of the web page. And once you have these element objects, you can look at its text member variable to look at the HTML in that element, or you can call its click or send keys method to click or type uh, into that element. And then the submit method will simulate clicking on the submit button for an HTML form. And the browser itself can be co controlled with the back, forward, refresh, and quit methods. These will simulate the back, forward, and refresh buttons, and also closing the browser. Welcome to Lesson 41, which roughly covers pages 256 to 261 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In the previous two lessons, you learned how to download web pages and parse their HTML. This is fine if you just need the static text from a URL, but sometimes the web pages you want to access will require you to log in, or they rely on JavaScript in order to work properly. This isn't something you can easily do by just downloading a URL. The Selenium module will launch a web browser that you can programmatically control from your Python program. You can call functions that will find HTML in the browser or fill out forms and login fields and click submit buttons. But because it launches a web browser, it's a bit slower and hard to run in the background if, say, you just need to download some files from the web. Selenium is a third-party module that you can install by running pip install selenium. Consult the course notes or Appendix A of the Automate book for instructions on installing it. For this lesson, you'll need the Firefox web browser installed. This will be the browser that you control. If you don't already have Firefox, you can download it for free from getfirefox.com. Importing the modules for Selenium is slightly tricky. Instead of import Selenium, you'll need to run from Selenium import WebDriver. And the exact reason why the Selenium module is set up this way is kind of beyond the scope of this lesson. Just remember that you have to import it as from Selenium import WebDriver. And after that, you can launch the Firefox browser with Selenium by calling the webdriver.firefox function. 
and this will return a browser object, which we'll store here in this variable called browser. But notice, once I run this instruction, a new Firefox window has been launched. I'll just set this off to the side. And you can now control this by calling methods on this browser object, the most basic of which is the get method, which will just send this browser to a URL. So I'll just pass it the string automate the boring stuff.com. And you can see my Python code is controlling this browser. So everything that a web browser does, Selenium is basically simulating. Now let's use CSS selectors to find an element on this page. Say I wanted to click on this link right here for the chapter zero link. I'm just going to use the trick of right clicking on it and selecting inspect element. And here I'll right click here to get a unique CSS selector by clicking on copy unique selector. So this is a selector string, just like the kind that we used in beautiful soup. So what I'm gonna do to get this element is I will call browsers find element by CSS selector, which is kind of a long name for this method, but I'll just pass it that CSS selector. And now you can see I have an, a web element object stored in the elem variable. And so once I have this element object, which represents a single element on this web page, I can then just call its click method and that will simulate clicking on that link, on that element, in the web browser. So if this element was a link, or if it was a checkbox, or if it was a submit button, you can simulate clicking on it. Now you can also specify, instead of a unique CSS selector, a more general CSS selector in, that will match multiple elements. And using that, we can then call the find elements plural, by CSS selector. And say if I just wanted to get all of the paragraph elements from that HTML page, you can see that this method returns a list of these element objects. Here I have 109 matching paragraph elements from that page. Selenium has several different methods for getting web elements from the web page. The ones that you'll most often use are find element by CSS selector and find elements by CSS selector, but you can also find elements by class name, by ID, link text, uh, the name or the tag name. All of these methods have a singular element form that will just return the first matching element, or find elements, plural, which will return every matching element that it finds. And there's more documentation on these in the Automate book. So we know how to click on things. Let's see how we can type into a web page as well. I'm just going to click on this link right here, and here we can find a search field for the automatetheboringstuff.com website. So I'm just going to right-click on this to find its CS to find a CSS selector that matches this. So I'll just copy unique selector. So here I'll just have to get a an element for that search field by calling the find element by CSS selector. And now that I have this element object, I can then call its send keys method. And then I can pass it any string which will then be typed into that field. So if this was a search bar like this is, or if it was a username or password field, you could type in any text you want into it. So in a lot of HTML forms, I would have to find the submit button and then get an element object for that and then call its click method. But Selenium helps us out with HTML forms. I can just take this search fields form and call submit and Selenium will automatically find the HTML form associated with this uh, text field and then invoke its submit action. So I don't actually have to call click on anything. And you can see I've just done a search for Zophie, which is the name of my cat who features prominently in all of these chapter 17 pictures. So we've been interacting with the web pages in this browser, but using the browser objects method, you can also uh, control the browser itself. 
If I wanted to press the back button on the browser, I could just call the back function. Same thing with forward. Or if I wanted to hit the refresh or reload button, I could just call the refresh method. And once I'm done with everything and I want to close the browser, I can just call the quit method. And that will immediately make the browser that Selenium launched disappear. So we've seen how Selenium can be used to interact with the browser's web pages and interact with the browser itself. Let's just bring up another window. Now let's take a look at how your Python scripts can use Selenium to read the content of the web pages. First, we'll have to get an element object for the part of the web page that we want to read. Let's say, let's just grab this one right here. I'm going to inspect element, copy unique selector. Oh, whoops. And all web elements have a text member variable that contains a string of the text inside of that element. If you want the entire text for the website, the easiest thing to do is probably just grab the HTML or body element, which should contain the entire web page. If we take a look at the source by pressing Control U, you can see that the HTML element is the first element for the entire web page. So that'll contain everything in the web page. So Selenium can do much more beyond the functions described here, but this is the basics of it. Going to websites, finding elements that we want to click on, or typing text into fields and submitting forms, that's what most web browsing is. And now we have a way to write Python scripts that can do all of these actions automatically. But if you want to learn more about Selenium, you can read the full documentation at selenium-python.readthedocs.org or read the rest of chapter 11 of Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. Now to recap, to import Selenium, you need to run from Selenium import WebDriver. Just running import Selenium doesn't work. And to open the browser, run webdriver.firefox. This will actually launch the Firefox web browser and you'll see it appear on your screen. The browser's get method can be used to send it to a particular website and the find element or find elements by CSS selector method is the main way that you'll use to grab element objects representing parts of the web page. And once you have these element objects, you can look at its text member variable to look at the HTML in that element, or you can call its click or send keys method to click or type uh, into that element. And then the submit method will simulate clicking on the submit button for an HTML form. And the browser itself can be co controlled with the back, forward, refresh, and quit methods. These will simulate the back, forward, and refresh buttons, and also closing the browser. Welcome to lesson 46. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to send emails from our Python programs. Uh, this can be a great way to send notifications, say if you have a program that uh, is doing web scraping and checking a website over and over again, you can have this program then email you whenever it finds some particular thing that you're looking for. Or maybe you need to send out emails to a bunch of specific people based on some criteria that you program in, like maybe a, a program that goes through a spreadsheet and then finds people who are behind on dues or or haven't received a reminder in a while and then just email them in particular. This can save you a lot of copying and pasting email addresses into some email program like Gmail. Let's get started. So the protocol that sending email uses is called SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. And Python has an implementation of this protocol in a module called SMTPLib. So there are a lot of different steps to this. So I'm just going to go through all the steps of sending an email first, and then we can later look at each step in more detail. So first, let's go ahead and import smtplib. This is the simple mail transfer protocol library. 
Next, we'll have to create a connection object, which I'll st uh, store in a variable called con. And the function we want to call is smtplib.smtp in caps. And then we'll have to connect to the SMTP server. This is the domain name of your email server. So I'm going to use Gmail. And their SMTP server is at smtp.gmail.com. And then followed by the port number, which is usually port 587. So we have this connection object. And now let's go ahead and connect to the server. So this will actually send out internet traffic from our Python program. We're going to call it the LO function, which <laughs> uh, this is a lot of history of why it has this weird name. It used to be hello with just one L, and then that got switched around to LO, and you just know that you have to call this function to start the connection. So that's the hello function. And next, we can see that it returned this tuple of an integer which is the code, the response code. Anything that begins with 200 means okay, so 250 means yeah, okay, we connected. And then the second item here, this is actually a bytes object and not a string, but it can easily be interpreted as a string. Um, bytes are sort of beyond the scope of this lesson, but here you can see, okay, it returned us a message that said, you know, everything looks great. So after connecting with hello, we have to start the TLS encryption, so that way when we send our password, it'll be encrypted. So this returned code 220, that means everything's okay. And now let's go ahead and log in. And so we have to call the login function, pass it our username, so aswigert at gmail.com, and then the password, which is this. Of course, by the time you watch this video, uh, I will have changed this password, so don't bother trying to hack into my email account. So now we're, our script is now logged in and we can start sending emails by calling the send mail function. So first we'll have to get the from address, which will just be aswigert at gmail.com. And then we pass the to address. So I'm just gonna go ahead and email myself. Just remember that the first one is the from address, which you should make your email address the same that you logged in with. And then the second is who this email is going to and then followed by the body of the email. Now this is kind of complicated because the headers and the body of the email are all crammed into this string and they follow a certain format. So here's the format. First type subject with a capital S colon space and then type in the subject. So this will be a single line. Um, I'll say the subject is so long. And then we'll have a new line character that ends the subject and then another new line character that means this we're done with the headers. There are other headers besides subject, but I'm just going to talk about the subject header. So basically we just need these two new line characters and then we'll have the main body of the email. So I'll just write an email to myself. Dear Al, another new line character. So long and thanks for all the fish. New line, new line from Al. Okay, and then I'll just press enter and then it sends this email. So you can send multiple emails at a time with the send mail function. You can consult the documentation for that. And the, res the return object and the return value from send mail is going to be a dictionary that has all of the emails that it failed to send. So if you get a blank dictionary back, that means the emails were all sent correctly. And so we could then send another email by calling the send mail method again. But at this point, I'm already done, so I'll have my script just call uh, quit. And that'll disconnect me from the SMTP server. I can go ahead and check my email right now and see that, yep, that got emailed to me. Okay, so that's the entire process. Let's dive into the details for each part. This is kind of complicated because there's a lot of different steps. You don't have to memorize all the steps. Uh, just be familiar with them enough so that you can look up the documentation. So the first thing we do is import the SMTP library. That's pretty standard enough. And then we call this SMTP function, passing it the domain name and port number. So the port number for the SMTP protocol is 587. Uh, ports are a part of the internet address that you're sending data to. So it's 
on this server and then on this port of that server. So this is a domain name. If you've ever configured Outlook or Thunderbird or some other email client to connect to maybe your ISP's email address, you might have gone through a step like this. So every ISP or email service has their own domain name for, for SMTP servers. Usually it'll just be whatever their name is .com, but with SMTP dot in front of it. So on table 16.1, you can see here's a bunch of very popular email providers such as Gmail or Outlook or Yahoo. And here's the SMTP server domain names. You can see for at and and Verizon, they use port 465. So you would enter the integer 465 here for those. Next, we call the hello method just to connect to that SMTP server. And then we just call start TLS to begin encryption. Most modern email servers will require that you actually start encryption before you can actually log in. And then next, you'll call the login method and pass it your, your username and password as strings. And then finally, sendmail will actually send out the emails. And then when you're all done, you can call the quit method to disconnect. Uh, one thing to keep in mind if you're using Gmail, Google has a thing called application-specific passwords. That means that your typical Google account password isn't going to be the one that you log in with here. In fact, you have to go ahead and look up uh, Google app specific password. And you can find details for generating an application specific password. This is so that you can create a password for say Python programs or for your phone or if your TV logs into your email account or whatever. And that way, if you have to change one of the passwords, you won't have to change your password on multiple devices because each device will have its own password. And then calling the send mail method will actually send out the email. Now note that a lot of email providers in order to prevent people from, you know, writing Python scripts that could spam millions of people a day, they'll usually limit you at, I think Gmail has a, a limit of about 100 or 150 emails per day. Other providers might have a limit of 500 or 1000 per day. Basically, if you have to email out thousands of emails every day, you should probably look into an actual commercial mailing list service. So that's the entire process. To recap, first you just import SMTP lib, then you call the SMTP function, passing it the domain name of your email provider's SMTP server, then call LO, then call start TLS, then call login with your password and username, and then call send mail with the from, to, and body strings of the email. Remember that in order to have the subject, you need to have subject colon space, then the subject line, followed by two new line characters before the main part of the email is sent. Welcome to lesson 46. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to send emails from our Python programs. Uh, this can be a great way to send notifications. Say if you have a program that uh, is doing web scraping and checking a website over and over again, you can have this program then email you whenever it finds some particular thing that you're looking for. Or maybe you need to send out emails to a bunch of specific people based on some criteria that you program in, like maybe a, a program that goes through a spreadsheet and then finds people who are behind on dues or, or haven't received a reminder in a while and then just email them in particular. This can save you a lot of copying and pasting email addresses into some email program like Gmail. Let's get started. So the protocol that sending email uses is called SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. And Python has an implementation of this protocol in a module called SMTP lib. So there are a lot of different steps to this. So I'm just gonna go through all the steps of sending an email first, and then we can later look at each step in more detail. So first, let's go ahead and import SMTP lib. This is the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol library. Next, we'll have to create a connection object, which I'll st uh, store in a variable called con. And the function we want to call is smtplib.smtp in caps. And then we'll have to connect to the SMTP server. This is the domain name of your email server. So I'm going to use Gmail. And their SMTP server is at smtp.gmail.com. 
and then followed by the port number, which is usually port 587. So we have this connection object. And now let's go ahead and connect to the server. So this will actually send out internet traffic from our Python program. We're going to call it the LO function, which <laughs> uh, this is a lot of history of why it has this weird name. It used to be hello with just one L and then that got switched around to LO and you just know that you have to call this function to start the connection. So that's the hello function. And next, we can see that it returned this tuple of an integer, which is the code, the response code. Anything that begins with 200 means OK. So 250 means, yeah, OK, we connected. And then the second item here, this is actually a bytes object and not a string, but it can easily be interpreted as a string. Um, bytes are sort of beyond the scope of this lesson. But here you can see, OK, it returned us a message that said, you know, everything looks great. So after connecting with hello, we have to start the TLS encryption, so that way when we send our password, it'll be encrypted. So this returned code 220, that means everything's okay. And now let's go ahead and log in. And so we have to call the login function, pass it our username, so aswigert at gmail.com, and then the password, which is this. Of course, by the time you watch this video, uh, I will have changed this password, so don't bother trying to hack into my email account. So now, we're, our script is now logged in, and we can start sending emails by calling the sendmail function. So first, we'll have to get the from address, which will just be aswigert at gmail.com. And then we pass the to address. So I'm just going to go ahead and email myself. Just remember that the first one is the from address, which you should make your email address the same that you logged in with. And then the second is who this email is going to and then followed by the body of the email. Now this is kind of complicated because the headers and the body of the email are all crammed into this string and they follow a certain format. So here's the format. First type subject with a capital S colon space and then type in the subject. So this will be a single line. Um, I'll say the subject is so long and then we'll have a new line character that ends the subject and then another new line character that means this we're done with the headers. There are other headers besides subject, but I'm just going to talk about the subject header. So basically, we just need these two new line characters, and then we'll have the main body of the email. So I'll just write an email to myself. Dear Al, another new line character. So long, and thanks for all the fish. New line, new line, from Al. OK, and then I'll just press Enter and then it sends this email. So you can send multiple emails at a time with the send mail function. You can consult the documentation for that. And the, res the return object and the return value from send mail is going to be a dictionary that has all of the emails that it failed to send. So if you get a blank dictionary back, that means the emails were all sent correctly. And so we could then send another email by calling the send mail method again. But at this point, I'm already done, so I'll have my script just call uh, quit. And that'll disconnect me from the SMTP server. I can go ahead and check my email right now and see that, yep, that got emailed to me. OK, so that's the entire process. Let's dive into the details for each part. This is kind of complicated because there's a lot of different steps. You don't have to memorize all the steps. Uh, just be familiar with them enough so that you can look up the documentation. So the first thing we do is import the SMTP library. That's pretty standard enough. And then we call this SMTP function, passing it the domain name and port number. So the port number for the SMTP protocol is 587. Uh, ports are a part of the internet address that you're sending data to. So it's on this server and then on this port of that server. So this is a domain name. If you've ever configured Outlook or Thunderbird or some other email client to connect to maybe your ISP's email address, you might have gone through a step like this. So every ISP or email service has their own domain name for, for SMTP servers. Usually it'll just be whatever their name is.com, but with smtp dot in front of it. So 
on table 16 one you can see here's a bunch of very popular email providers such as Gmail or Outlook or Yahoo and here's the SMTP server domain names you can see for AT&T and Verizon they use port 465 so you would enter the integer 465 here for those next we call the hello method just to connect to that SMTP server and then we just call start TLS to begin encryption most modern email servers will require that you actually start encryption before you can actually log in. And then next you'll call the login method and pass it your, your username and password as strings. And then finally sendmail will actually send out the emails. And then when you're all done you can call the quit method to disconnect. Now one thing to keep in mind if you're using Gmail, Google has a thing called application specific passwords. That means that your typical Google account password isn't going to be the one that you log in with here. In fact, you have to go ahead and look up uh, Google app specific password. And you can find details for generating an application specific password. This is so that you can create a password for say Python programs or for your phone or if your TV logs into your email account or whatever. And that way, if you have to change one of the passwords, you won't have to change your password on multiple devices because each device will have its own password. And then calling the send mail method will actually send out the email. Now note that a lot of email providers in order to prevent people from, you know, writing Python scripts that could spam millions of people a day, they'll usually limit you at, I think Gmail has a, a limit of about 100 or 150 emails per day. Other providers might have a limit of 500 or 1,000 per day. Basically, if you have to email out thousands of emails every day, you should probably look into an actual commercial mailing list service. So that's the entire process. To recap, first you just import SMTP lib, then you call the SMTP function, passing it the domain name of your email provider's SMTP server then call hello, then call start TLS, then call login with your password and username, and then call send mail with the from, to, and body strings of the email. Remember that in order to have the subject, you need to have subject colon space, then the subject line, followed by two new line characters before the main part of the email is sent. Welcome to lesson 47. In the last lesson, we went over how to send emails using the SMTP protocol. In this lesson, we'll learn how to check your email's inbox. So just as SMTP is the protocol for sending email, the Internet Message Access Protocol, or IMAP, specifies how to communicate with your email provider server to retrieve emails that were sent to your email address. Now unfortunately, IMAP is a fairly complicated protocol. The protocols for email are pretty much as old as the internet itself. They really were not designed to be user friendly. So Python comes with, with a module called IMAP lib, but we're not going to use that one. Instead, we're going to use two third party modules. First is called IMAP client, and the second is called PyZ mail. So you can install those using pip by consulting the course notes or appendix A of the automate the boring stuff with Python textbook. So again, I'm just going to go through all the code steps of checking your email using these modules. And once I'm done, I'll go back and dive into each step in more detail later. So the first thing we're going to do is import IMAP client. Next, we're going to create a connection object by calling IMAP clients IMAP client and pass it the domain name of the email provider's server. In my case, it's going to be imap.gmail.com. And then we're going to have to pass it this keyword argument, uh, SSL equals true. SSL is an encryption algorithm. Uh, this basically tells IMAP client that yes, we do want to use SSL encryption. And next, we're going to call the login method. So I'm going to log into my email account, aswigert at gmail.com, and then pass it the password. And we get a bytes object, which can be interpreted like a string. And it basically tells us, yes, you have successfully logged in. That was the correct username and password. So we've logged in. Now let's select a folder. 99% of the time, this is just going to be inbox. 
and we're going to set the read only keyword argument to true. So unless you're going to delete emails, you'll always want to set this as true just so that you don't accidentally delete any emails during this logged in session. And that returns a whole bunch of stuff which we can pretty much mostly ignore. And now we have to find emails and we'll do that by calling the search method. So the IMAP protocol has its own special syntax for searching. And you basically have to pass it as a list of strings and each string will be formatted in this special IMAP search syntax. So I'm just gonna use a really basic example. I wanna grab all the emails since, let's say, uh, August 20th of 2015. So remember, this is a string that is inside of a list, and that's what we're passing to the search method. This will return a list of unique IDs, and each unique ID references a particular email. So I'm gonna store this in a variable called UIDs. That's great. So these UIDs are just integers, and we can see it's now returned all of the UIDs for the emails that I've received since uh, August 20th of this year. This integer is far from actually a useful email, you know, with a subject line and to and from email addresses that we're used to. We need to translate this UID into an actual email. And we do that by calling the fetch method for the connection object. But of course, this is also kind of complicated. The first argument will be a list with the UID that we want. So let's say I want to grab this email. I'm just going to copy and paste that UID there. And then the second argument is what parts of the email that, we're, that we want. So you can look at the documentation for this later, but 99% of the time you're just going to pass it this uh, body with square brackets after it, and then also uh, flags. So you're just going to pass this exact list value. Oh, whoops, I want to store this in a variable called raw message. So fetch has returned this dictionary-like structure that you can see it looks really complicated, but it has all the uh, information about the email inside of it. You can sort of see, oh, here's the from part. It's an email I sent to myself. Here was the subject line, and then the main part of the email. But, you know, we don't really want to parse this string on our own. That would be kind of complicated. So instead, let's just use the pyzmail module to do this for us. So let's go ahead and impo import this. Remember that pyzmail is a third-party module, so you'll have to install it with pip first. And what we're going to do now is call pyzmail's pyzmessage.factory method. I'm really sorry about this. This is super complicated. And we're going to pass it raw message but not just raw message. We actually have to pass it um, this UID value, which is the key here. And then even inside of that, because that's the key and the value is another dictionary inside there, uh, we're gonna pass it this value, which is a bytes value. Uh, it's technically not a string. You can see that because it begins with a B, lowercase b here. So I'm going to have to copy and paste this. And so this particular part of the raw message that was returned by fetch is passed to pyzmail.pyzmessage.factory. Yeah, so as I said, this is really complicated. Um, the good news is you don't have to memorize all of this. You can always just look up this information later. Oh, right, and so this returns a pyz message object. So we want to save that to a variable. We'll just save that to a variable called message. And finally, once we have this message object, we have something that we can work with easily. So we can call the get subject method on this message object. You can see here's that subject line for the email that I sent to myself so long. We can also get any addresses from it, like the from address, who this email was from. And you can see usually this tuple value will have a string of the email sender's name, if it was set, and then their email address. I don't have one set for this email account, so it just sent 
aswigert at gmail.com as my full name. But we could also see who this was sent to, which apparently is blank. Um, that might have been something weird with the smtp lib method calls that I made. But you can see in the blind carbon copy, this was cc'd also to a swigert. But if we want the actual body of the email, um, we're going to have to go through yet some more complicated parts. So you may be familiar with the fact that you can send text emails, which are just plain text, or HTML emails. Uh, if you've ever received an email and it had colorful text or different fonts or images embedded inside of it, that was an HTML email. If the email was just plain text, all the same font and all the same color and everything, then that was just a text email. So we can see if this was a text email or an HTML email, or if it had both text and HTML parts by looking at the text part member variable. And if text part is set to none, then that means that there was no text part, but that's not the case here. So we can see, oh, okay, there was a text part here. Let's see if there was an HTML part as well. Oh, okay, that returned none. Idle's interactive shell doesn't actually show none values but we can confirm that by just having this small expression, uh, HTML part equal equals none, and that evaluates to true. So this email only has a text part. So in order to get the main message of this email, we're gonna have to call get payload method, and in turn, we have to call decode on that. And this is the string encoding. You don't have to know what that is. Um, just know that 99% of the time you can pass UTF-8 to it. And here you finally get a plain and ordinary string. Now if this doesn't work, you can actually try to figure out what encoding the email was sent as. This will usually be in the message.textpart.charset, except in this case this is set to the value none. So we're just gonna have to guess 99% of the time it'll be UTF-8. So we can also search and fetch other emails. Um, and then once we're done, we can just call logout. But I'm not done quite yet. Let's go ahead and dive into some more detail with each of these steps. You can see up here, when I connected to this IMAP domain name, this will be dependent on what your email provider is. You can usually just Google for this information, but here's some common email providers like Gmail or Yahoo or Comcast. And you can see the domain name for their IMAP servers are pretty typical. Usually it's just whatever the company is .com, but with IMAP dot in front of it. And next, when we call that search method, IMAP has its own particular syntax for how you search for emails. In this case, I just said, I wanna get all the emails that I've uh, that have arrived since uh, August 20th. And you have to format this date exactly like this. Two digits here, so if it was August 5th, I'd have to have 05, then a three letter month name in English, and then uh, the year with dashes in between. Now there's a whole lot of other search keys, keywords like this. Um, you could just send all, but I wouldn't recommend that because that would return the UID for all of the emails you've ever re received. Uh, you could also have before uh, or on and since, followed by a date in that particular format that I just showed you. Uh, you could find all of the emails that have a certain string inside a subject, or uh, all the emails that have a certain string inside the body, or using the text keyword here, a certain string in either the subject or the body. And if your string has that you're searching for has spaces in it, you'll just have double quotes on either side of it. So this string value is what you would pass to the search method. You can see it's a string that has text, meaning we're gonna search for the subject or the body, and then the string that we're searching for inside there has double quotes here. There's a whole bunch of these, and you can see them all on table 16-3 in the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook, but you can check them for who they're from or who they were sent to, uh, if you've already read or haven't read the email yet, if you've replied or haven't replied to it. Now the IMAP pro protocol is really old, so it's kind of using these old-fashioned terms 
uh, instead of read, it's seen and unseen, and instead of replied to, it's answered or unanswered. Uh, you can see if it's a draft, you get all your draft emails, uh, any emails that are larger or smaller than a certain number of bytes. Uh, you can check the documentation for IMAP client for more details. So while we're still logged into the IMAP server, I'm going to just go in to through into some more details. Now remember, after we had logged in, we called this select folder and I selected the inbox. Now the inbox is the main folder that you're going to be use, using all the time, but maybe you've set up other folders or you want to check your spam folder or your draft folder. The way that you can find all of the folders is by using the connection objects list folders method, which will return this really complicated looking list. But in this list, it will have a tuple value and the name of that folder is going to be the third item inside that tuple. So you can see this is my drafts folder. This is a filler folder that I have. Now say you wanted to delete emails. First of all, you would have to select the folder. Uh, in this case, I'll just try inbox and then select it. But this time have the read only keyword set to false. This will allow us to modify the inbox folder, which is what we want to do when we delete it. So same as before, we're going to get the UIDs by calling search. And let me just find all the emails that I received on today's date, August 24th, 2015. So here's the unique IDs for all those emails. I'm going to delete this one, say, all I have to do is call the delete messages and then pass it a list of all the UIDs I want to delete. So in this case, I'll send a list with this UID to delete this particular email. Or if I just wanted to delete all of these emails that I received on August 24th, I could just pass the UIDs list itself. Now I don't actually want to delete those, so I'm just going to erase that. So that wraps it up for, for checking your email using Python. Now this was really complicated, and unfortunately these were the best modules I could find to make this as simple as possible, but even still this is pretty complicated. There's lots of different steps. You don't have to memorize all of these steps, but you can then look up the documentation later to figure out if you want to do particular things. Uh, if you want to look at the documentation for the IMAP client module, you can read it here at imapclient.readthedocs.org. And PyZmail's documentation is at magicsys.net slash PyZmail. And all of this is also covered in the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python book that you can read online here at automatetheboringstuff.com slash chapter 16. Welcome to lesson 47. In the last lesson, we went over how to send emails using the SMTP protocol. In this lesson, we'll learn how to check your email's inbox. So just as SMTP is the protocol for sending email, the Internet Message Access Protocol, or IMAP, specifies how to communicate with your email provider server to retrieve emails that were sent to your email address. Now, unfortunately, IMAP is a fairly complicated protocol. The protocols for email are pretty much as old as the internet itself. They really weren't designed to be user-friendly. So Python comes with, with a module called imaplib, but we're not going to use that one. Instead, we're going to use two third-party modules. The first is called imapclient, and the second is called pyzmail. So you can install those using pip by consulting the course notes or Appendix A of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. So again, I'm just going to go through all the code steps of checking your email using these modules. And once I'm done, I'll go back and dive into each step in more detail later. So the first thing we're going to do is import IMAP client. Next, we're going to create a connection object by calling IMAP clients IMAP client and pass it the domain name of the email provider server. In my case, it's going to be imap.gmail.com. And then we're going to have to pass it this keyword argument, uh, SSL equals true. SSL is an encryption algorithm. Uh, this basically tells 
IMAP client that yes, we do want to use SSL encryption. And next, we're gonna call the login method. So I'm gonna log into my email account, aswigert at gmail.com, and then pass it the password. And we get a bytes object, which can be interpreted like a string, and it basically tells us, yes, you have successfully logged in. That was the correct username and password. So we've logged in. Now let's select a folder. 99% of the time, this is just going to be inbox. And we're going to set the read only keyword argument to true. So unless you're going to delete emails, you'll always want to set this as true just so that you don't accidentally delete any emails during this logged in session. And that returns a whole bunch of stuff which we can pretty much mostly ignore. And now we have to find emails and we'll do that by calling the search method. So the IMAP protocol has its own special syntax for searching. And you basically have to pass it as a list of strings and each string will be formatted in this special IMAP search syntax. So I'm just gonna use a really basic example. I wanna grab all the emails since, let's say, uh, August 20th of 2015. So remember, this is a string that is inside of a list, and that's what we're passing to the search method. This will return a list of unique IDs, and each unique ID references a particular email. So I'm gonna store this in a variable called UIDs. That's great. So these UIDs are just integers, and we can see it's now returned all of the UIDs for the emails that I've received since uh, August 20th of this year. This integer is far from actually a useful email, you know, with a subject line and to and from email addresses that we're used to. We need to translate this UID into an actual email. And we do that by calling the fetch method for the connection object. But of course, this is also kind of complicated. The first argument will be a list with the UID that we want. So let's say I want to grab this email. I'm just going to copy and paste that UID there. And then the second argument is what parts of the email that, we're, that we want. So you can look at the documentation for this later, but 99% of the time you're just going to pass it this uh, body with square brackets after it, and then also uh, flags. So you're just going to pass this exact list value. Oh, whoops, I want to store this in a variable called raw message. So fetch has returned this dictionary-like structure that you can see it looks really complicated, but it has all the uh, information about the email inside of it. You can sort of see, oh, here's the from part. It's an email I sent to myself. Here was the subject line, and then the main part of the email. But, you know, we don't really want to parse this string on our own. That would be kind of complicated. So instead, let's just use the pyzmail module to do this for us. So let's go ahead and impor import this. Remember that pyzmail is a third-party module, so you'll have to install it with pip first. And what we're going to do now is call pyzmail's pyzmessage.factory method. I'm really sorry about this. This is super complicated. And we're going to pass it raw message but not just raw message. We actually have to pass it um, this UID value, which is the key here. And then even inside of that, because that's the key and the value is another dictionary inside there, uh, we're gonna pass it this value, which is a bytes value. Uh, it's technically not a string. You can see that because it begins with a B, lowercase b here. So I'm going to have to copy and paste this. And so this particular part of the raw message that was returned by fetch is passed to pyzmail.pyzmessage.factory. Yeah, so as I said, this is really complicated. Um, the good news is you don't have to memorize all of this. You can always just look up this information later. Oh, right, and so this returns a PyZ message object. So we want to save that to a variable. We'll just save that to a variable called message. 
And finally, once we have this message object, we have something that we can work with easily. So we can call the get subject method on this message object. You can see here's that subject line for the email that I sent to myself so long. We can also get any addresses from it, like the from address, who this email was from. And you can see usually this tuple value will have a string of the email sender's name if it was set and then their email address. I don't have one set for this email account, so it just sent aswigert at gmail.com as my full name. But we could also see who this was sent to, which apparently is blank. Um, that might have been something weird with the SMTP lib method calls that I made. But you can see in the blind carbon copy, this was cc'd also to a swigert. But if we want the actual body of the email, um, we're going to have to go through yet some more complicated parts. So you may be familiar with the fact that you can send text emails, which are just plain text, or HTML emails. Uh, if you've ever received an email and it had colorful text or different fonts or images embedded inside of it, that was an HTML email. If the email was just plain text, all the same font and all the same color and everything, then that was just a text email. So we can see if this was a text email or an HTML email, or if it had both text and HTML parts by looking at the text part member variable. And if text part is set to none, then that means that there was no text part, but that's not the case here. So we can see, oh, okay, there was a text part here. Let's see if there was an HTML part as well. Oh, okay, that returned none. Idle's interactive shell doesn't actually show none values, but we can confirm that by just having this small expression, uh, HTML part equal equals none, and that evaluates to true. So this email only has a text part. So in order to get the main message of this email, we're going to have to call get payload method. And in turn, we have to call decode on that. And this is the string encoding. You don't have to know what that is. Um, just know that 99% of the time you can pass UTF-8 to it. And here you finally get a plain and ordinary string. Now, if this doesn't work, you can actually try to figure out what encoding the email was sent as. This will usually be in the message.textpart.charset, except in this case, this is set to the value none. So we're just going to have to guess 99% of the time it'll be UTF-8. So we can also search and fetch other emails. Um, and then once we're done, we can just call logout but I'm not done quite yet. Let's go ahead and dive into some more detail with each of these steps. You can see up here when I connected to this IMAP domain name, this will be dependent on what your email provider is. You can usually just Google for this information, but here's some common email providers like Gmail or Yahoo or Comcast. And you can see the domain name for their IMAP servers are pretty typical. Usually it's just whatever the company is dot com, but with IMAP dot in front of it. And next, when we call that search method, IMAP has its own particular syntax for how you search for emails. In this case, I just said I want to get all the emails that I've uh, that have arrived since uh, August 20th. And you have to format this date exactly like this two digits here. So if it was August 5th, I'd have to have zero five, then a three letter month name in English, and then uh, the year with dashes in between. Now there's a whole lot of other search keys, keywords like this. Um, you could just send all, but I wouldn't recommend that because that would return to the UID for all of the emails you've ever re received. Uh, you could also have before uh, or on and since followed by a date in that particular format that I just showed you. Uh, you could find all of the emails that have a certain string inside a subject, or uh, all the emails that have a certain string inside the body, or using the text keyword here, a certain string in either the subject or the body. And if your string has that you're searching for has spaces in it, you'll just have double quotes on either side of it. So this string value is what you would pass 
to the search method. You can see it's a string that has text, meaning we're going to search for the subject or the body, and then the string that we're searching for inside there has double quotes here. There's a whole bunch of these, and you can see them all on table 16-3 in the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook, but you can check them for who they're from or who they were sent to, uh, if you've already read or haven't read the email yet, if you've replied or haven't replied to it. Now the IMAP pro protocol is really old, so it's kind of using these old-fashioned terms. Uh, instead of read, it's seen and unseen, and instead of replied to, it's answered or unanswered. Uh, you can see if it's a draft, you get all your draft emails, uh, any emails that are larger or smaller than a certain number of bytes. Uh, you can check the documentation for IMAP client for more details. So while we're still logged into the IMAP server, I'm going to just go in to through into some more details. Now remember, after we had logged in, we called this select folder and I selected the inbox. Now the inbox is the main folder that you're going to be use, using all the time, but maybe you've set up other folders or you want to check your spam folder or your draft folder. The way that you can find all of the folders is by using the connection objects list folders method, which will return this really complicated looking list. But in this list, it will have a tuple value and the name of that folder is going to be the third item inside that tuple. So you can see this is my drafts folder. This is a filler folder that I have. Now say you wanted to delete emails. First of all, you would have to select the folder. Uh, in this case, I'll just try inbox and then select it. But this time have the read only keyword set to false. This will allow us to modify the inbox folder, which is what we want to do when we delete it. So same as before, we're going to get the UIDs by calling search. And let me just find all the emails that I received on today's date, August 24th, 2015. So here's the unique IDs for all those emails. I'm going to delete this one, say, all I have to do is call the delete messages and then pass it a list of all the UIDs I want to delete. So in this case, I'll send a list with this UID to delete this particular email. Or if I just wanted to delete all of these emails that I received on August 24th, I could just pass the UIDs list itself. Now I don't actually want to delete those, so I'm just going to erase that. So that wraps it up for, for checking your email using Python. Now this was really complicated, and unfortunately these were the best modules I could find to make this as simple as possible, but even still this is pretty complicated. There's lots of different steps. You don't have to memorize all of these steps, but you can then look up the documentation later to figure out if you want to do particular things. Uh, if you want to look at the documentation for the IMAP client module, you can read it here at imapclient.readthedocs.org. And PyZmail's documentation is at magicsys.net slash PyZmail. And all of this is also covered in the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python book that you can read online here at automatetheboringstuff.com slash chapter 16. Welcome to lesson 48. We're now in the home stretch. This lesson covers the last chapter of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook, chapter 18, GUI automation. So the ultimate tools for automating tasks on your computer are programs you write that directly control the keyboard and mouse. These programs can control other applications by sending them virtual keystrokes and mouse clicks, just as if you were sitting at the computer and interacting with the, with the applications yourself. Uh, this technique is known as Graphical User Interface Automation, or GUI Automation for short. With GUI Automation, your programs can do anything that a human user sitting at the computer can do, except spill coffee on the keyboard. Think of GUI Automation as programming a robotic arm, and this robotic arm can type at the keyboard and move the mouse for you. Now, this technique is particularly useful for tasks that involve a lot of mindless clicking or filling out forms. 
Now it's always better to use a module that can directly interact with some software or some web service, but as a last resort, you can always just write a script that directly controls the mouse and keyboard. To do this, we're going to use a third-party module called PyAutoGUI. You can install this module using pip, uh, and the documentation for it is at pyautogui.readthedocs.org. So in this lesson, we're going to cover all the mouse controlling functions. Now you can think of your screen as a Cartesian coordinate system with X and Y coordinates. The X is the left to right point on the screen, and the Y coordinate is the up and down point on the screen. And combined, these can point to any point on the screen. So in computing, 0, 0 is at the top left corner of the screen, and the x-axis coordinates increase going to the right, and the y-axis coordinates increase going down. Let's go ahead and check out PyAutoGUI by importing it, and PyAutoGUI has a couple functions that we'll look at first. First is the size, which returns the screen resolution. Here we can see that this screen is currently set to 1280 by 720 pixels, so if I wanted to put these into two variables, I could use the multiple assignment trick. And next we can look at the position function, which will return the current coordinates of the mouse cursor. So you can see right here was 324 at 270. If I move it up to the left top corner and call that function, you can see I'm almost at 0, 0. And then down here in the bottom right corner, I'm right here at 1279, 719. Remember that the coordinates start at zero, so even though this is 1280 by 720, the leftmost and rightmost coordinates are one less than those. So let's look at the first function for controlling the mouse. Well, the first one is pretty simple. It's the move to function, and we can just pass it in x and y coordinates. So I'll say uh, x coordinate of 10 and y coordinate of 10. And when I run this, you can see the mouse cursor has instantly teleported itself to the upper left corner at 1010. 10. Now that was pretty fast. Let's say we just wanted this to move uh, slowly, kind of mimicking what a slow human would do. We can pass it the keyword argument duration and the number of seconds we want this to take. So let's say I want it to move over there uh, in one and a half seconds. When I run this, now I'm not moving the mouse at all. This is totally the computer moving that gradually over here in one and a half seconds. Let me run that again just so you can see it. And it's going to 1010 10 in 1 1.5 seconds. So you can make the duration even longer to make it move slower, or you can make it super fast, or you can just leave it off entirely to have the mouse cursor move instantly to that XY coordinate. So that's moving the mouse to an absolute position on the screen. But say we just wanted to move it somewhere relative to where the mouse cursor already is, we can call the moveRel function, and this one takes arguments of the x offset and y offset. So if I wanted to move it, say, to the right by 20 pixels, I could pass it 20 for the x offset and 0 for the y offset. And that was a little bit slow. Let me try that again with something a bit bigger. Here, move 200 pixels to the right. You can see it's instantly moved there. You can also pass move rel a duration argument as well. Let's say in two seconds, move 200 pixels to the right. Nice. You can see it's very precise movement, much more precise and linear than how I, as a human, move the mouse cursor around. And so let's just have one more example. Say we wanted to move this just uh, 100 pixels up. And remember, y coordinates decrease going up, so we'll have to pass it negative 100 for the white offset. Ooh, that was probably a bit too fast. Let me add a duration of 1 there and run this. And you can see the mouse cursor slowly moves up the screen by exactly 100 pixels. So that's moving the mouse. Let's go ahead and have the mouse click somewhere. So let's say I want to click on the help file right here. Let me go ahead and figure out what the coordinates are on the screen for that by calling where the mouse position is once I have the mouse cursor right here. So I'll just press enter. So this point where the mouse is right now is at 339.38. So I can say, okay, go ahead and click on 
the xy coordinates 339, 38. And when I do that, you can see the mouse has instantly moved to those xy coordinates and then clicked on it. So I didn't actually click on it at all. That's totally Pi Auto GUI clicking for me. Now the click function has a whole bunch of other keyword arguments that you can look up in the documentation, but just know that if you want to do something like double click, you can just call the double click function and also pass it some xy coordinates. Or if you wanted to right click or middle click, it has the exact same arguments that you pass. In fact, you don't even have to pass any arguments, any xy coordinates to the click function. You can just simply call click and this will click wherever the mouse cursor currently is. So I'm just going to move the mouse over window and then press enter to call click. And you can see Pi Auto GUI has clicked where the mouse is for me. So this is pretty nice. You can already think, well, you have a the ability to have your Python script just click on anything on the screen. So it could click here and then click on control panel and then start controlling your computer and everything. That's the really cool thing about GUI automation. And I'll show you a really clever trick. I'm going to go ahead and open up MS Paint and move that over here. And I've already written a small script that uses Pi Auto GUI. So one thing to know is just like there's move to and move rel, there's also a drag to and drag rel function, and that takes the exact same arguments. This is just in X and Y coordinates or in X offset and Y offset. And this time while moving the mouse, Pi Auto GUI will also hold down the left mouse button. So it performs a drag. So this small program that I've written will move the mouse around and drag it in a square spiral shape. So you can see there's a loop right here and it starts moving right and then moving down, moving left and moving up. And it does that in a loop over and over again to draw out this spiral shape. So I'm going to have it draw out the spiral shape because it's dragging the mouse. It's doing the same thing as drawing in this MS Paint program. Let me undo that. So I'm going to put the mouse uh, right about here and then while this window is still in focus, I'm going to press F5. And now you can see that Pi Auto GUI has dragged the mouse around to draw out this square spiral shape for me. That's pretty neat. Here, I'll just uh, put this program in focus again, and then press F5 to draw it out one more time. That's pretty nice. So you can see, now your Python programs can interact with other programs on your computer. This is really nice, but there's one thing that I have to warn you about. So you might be familiar with this Disney movie called Fantasia, and there's a scene in it called The Sorcerer's Apprentice where Mickey Mouse is this wizard who has, is given the task of filling up this bathtub full of water, so he enchants a broom to do it for him. Now this broom is just mindlessly programmed to fill up a bucket of water and then pour it into the tub. But Mickey the wizard loses control and can't stop this broom from executing its program. And so eventually the broom starts filling up and overfilling the tub and water gets everywhere and it's a giant mess. So a similar thing can happen with your GUI automation programs. Because while Pi Auto GUI is controlling the mouse, that means that you can't use the mouse to click on say idle and then press control C or click on the close button. So you might lose control of your computer to this program. So Pi Auto GUI has a failsafe installed. And this is while your program is executing, uh, every time you make a call to a Pi Auto GUI function, it checks if the mouse cursor is in the top left corner at the zero, at the zero, zero coordinates. And if so, it will then raise an exception to stop the program. So if the mouse is ever moving around a lot, just try slamming the mouse up and to the left to get it into this corner. And you just need it there for a brief moment for Pi Auto GUI to detect this and then stop. Pi Auto GUI by default has a tenth of a second pause after every single call. So that'll give you enough time to just slam the mouse up to the upper left corner. So let me show you an example of this using the spiral drawing program. So I'm going to run this and then try to cut it off in the middle of its execution. So press F5 to start and oh, OK, excellent. So you can see it kind of messed up 
the drawing right here because I was constantly trying to move the mouse cursor up to the top left corner. But once I got it there, Pi Auto GUI raised this failsafe exception and that crashed the program and stopped it. So that's much better than, you know, pulling the plug on your computer to shut it down. So moving and clicking the mouse is great, but you're first going to have to carefully figure out the coordinates for every part that you want to click on on the screen. There's an easier way to do this, but unfortunately we can't run it from idle. We'll have to actually open up a terminal. So I'm going to hit Windows key R and run the command line tool and just run Python from here and import PyAutoGUI and call PyAutoGUI's display mouse position function. This is a really handy sort of mini program inside the PyAutoGUI module. What this does is it shows the real-time position in the X and Y coordinates of where the mouse is, as well as the RGB, that's the red, green, blue value um, of the pixel that the mouse is currently over. So you can see I'm over black right now, so the RGB value is all zeros. But if I'm over white, it's all 255. If I'm over this green text, the red and blue are zero, but the green part is 160. So these this tuple of integers is just is a common way in computing to represent a specific color. But mostly you can just look right here. So say, um, oh hey, I want to click on file. So I can just move the mouse over here and then maybe just write down on paper, oh, that's at x18, y40. And then say, move this off to the side. Say after I click on file, I want to click on open and that'll be at x58 and y118. And so this really helps quicken how long it takes for you to find uh, co screen coordinates for your GUI automation program. And press Control c to quit. Now unfortunately this doesn't work in idle because it has a slightly different way of drawing out text characters. You can see if you tried to run it, it ends up looking like a giant mess. Display mouse uh, position. Yeah, that's actually not too great. So let's hit Control C to stop that. But running display mouse position from a terminal can really help speed up all gathering all of the screen coordinates that you need. So to recap, controlling the mouse and keyboard is called GUI automation, and the Pi Auto GUI third-party module has many functions to do this. Uh, Pi Auto GUI's size a function returns the screen resolution, position returns the mouse position, move to will move the mouse to an x, y coordinate, and drag to will drag the mouse to that x and y coordinate. And there's also move rel and drag rel, which moves or drags the mouse relative to its current position. These moves and drags are instantaneous, but you can pass a duration keyword argument to make it work slower and mimic what a human operator would do. PyAutoGUI also has click, double click, right click, and middle click functions to click the various mouse buttons. And if your program gets out of control, just slam the mouse cursor up to the top left and PyAutoGUI will raise that failsafe exception. And the complete documentation for PyAutoGUI is at pyautogui.readthedocs.org. Welcome to lesson 48. We're now in the home stretch. This lesson covers the last chapter of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook, chapter 18, GUI automation. So the ultimate tools for automating tasks on your computer are programs you write that directly control the keyboard and mouse. These programs can control other applications by sending them virtual keystrokes and mouse clicks just as if you were sitting at the computer and interacting with the, with the applications yourself. Uh, this technique is known as Graphical User Interface Automation, or GUI Automation for short. With GUI Automation, your programs can do anything that a human user sitting at the computer can do, except spill coffee on the keyboard. Think of GUI Automation as programming a robotic arm, and this robotic arm can type at the keyboard and move the mouse for you. Now, this technique is particularly useful for tasks that involve a lot of mindless clicking or filling out forms. Now it's always better to use a module that can directly interact with some software or some web service, but as a last resort, you can always just write a script that directly controls the mouse and keyboard. To do this, we're going to use a third-party module called PyAutoGUI. You can install this module using pip, uh, and the documentation for it is at pyautogui.readthedocs.org. So in this lesson, we're going to cover all the mouse controlling functions. Now you can think of your screen as a Cartesian coordinate system with X and Y coordinates. The X 
is the left to right point on the screen and the y coordinate is the up and down point on the screen and combined these can point to any point on the screen so in computing 0 0 is at the top left corner of the screen and the x axis coordinates increase going to the right and the y axis coordinates increase going down let's go ahead and check out pi auto gui by importing it and pi auto gui has a couple functions that we'll look at first First is the size, which returns the screen resolution. Here we can see that this screen is currently set to 1280 by 720 pixels. So if I wanted to put these into two variables, I could use the multiple assignment trick. And next we can look at the position function, which will return the current coordinates of the mouse cursor. So you can see right here was 324 at 270. If I move it up to the left top corner and call that function, you can see I'm almost at 0, 0. And then down here in the bottom right corner, I'm right here at 1279, 719. Remember that the coordinates start at 0, so even though this is 1280 by 720, the leftmost and rightmost coordinates are one less than those. So let's look at the first function for controlling the mouse. Well, the first one is pretty simple. It's the move to function, and we can just pass it an x and y coordinate. So I'll say uh, x coordinate of 10 and y coordinate of 10. And when I run this, you can see the mouse cursor has instantly teleported itself to the upper left corner at 10, 10. Now that was pretty fast. Let's say we just wanted this to move uh, slowly, kind of mimicking what a slow human would do. We can pass it the keyword argument duration and the number of seconds we want this to take. So let's say I want it to move over there uh, in one and a half seconds. When I run this, now I'm not moving the mouse at all. This is totally the computer moving that gradually over here in one and a half seconds. Let me run that again just so you can see it. And it's going to 1010 in 1.5 seconds. So you can make the duration even longer to make it move slower, or you can make it super fast, or you can just leave it off entirely to have the mouse cursor move instantly to that xy coordinate. So that's moving the mouse to an absolute position on the screen, but say we just wanted to move it somewhere relative to where the mouse cursor already is, we can call the move rel function, and this one takes arguments of the x offset and y offset. So if I wanted to move it, say, to the right, by 20 pixels, we could pass it 20 for the x offset and 0 for the y offset. And that was a little bit slow. Let me try that again with something a bit bigger. Here, move 200 pixels to the right. You can see it's instantly moved there. You can also pass move rel a duration argument as well. Let's say in two seconds, move 200 pixels to the right. Nice. You can see it's very precise movement, much more precise and linear than how I, as a human, move the mouse cursor around. And so let's just have one more example. Say we wanted to move this just uh, 100 pixels up. And remember, y coordinates decrease going up, so we'll have to pass it negative 100 for the white offset. Ooh, that was probably a bit too fast. Let me add a duration of 1 there and run this. And you can see the mouse cursor slowly moves up the screen by exactly 100 pixels. So that's moving the mouse. Let's go ahead and have the mouse click somewhere. So let's say I want to click on the help file right here. Let me go ahead and figure out what the coordinates are on the screen for that by calling where the mouse position is once I have the mouse cursor right here. So I'll just press enter. So this point where the mouse is right now is at 339.38. So I can say, okay, go ahead and click on the xy coordinates 339.38. And when I do that, you can see the mouse has instantly moved to those xy coordinates and then clicked on it. So I didn't actually click on it at all. That's totally Pi Auto GUI clicking for me. Now the click function has a whole bunch of other keyword arguments that you can look up in the documentation. But just know that if you want to do something like double click, you can just call the double click function and also pass it some x, y coordinates. Or if you wanted to right click or middle click, 
it has the exact same arguments that you pass. In fact, you don't even have to pass any arguments, any x, y coordinates to the click function. You can just simply call click, and this will click wherever the mouse cursor currently is. So I'm just going to move the mouse over a window and then press enter to call click. And you can see PyAutoGUI has clicked where the mouse is for me. So this is pretty nice. You can already think, well, you have a the ability to have your Python script just click on anything on the screen. So it could click here and then click on control panel and then start controlling your computer and everything. That's the really cool thing about GUI automation. And I'll show you a really clever trick. I'm going to go ahead and open up MS Paint and move that over here. And I've already written a small script that uses PyAutoGUI. So one thing to know is, just like there's move to and move rel, there's also a drag to and drag rel function, and that takes the exact same arguments. This is just in x and y coordinates, or in x offset and y offset. And this time, while moving the mouse, PyAutoGUI will also hold down the left mouse button, so it performs a drag. So this small program that I've written will move the mouse around and drag it in a square spiral shape. So you can see there's a loop right here, and it starts moving right, and then moving down, moving left, and moving up. And it does that in a loop over and over again to draw out this spiral shape. So I'm going to have it draw out the spiral shape because it's dragging the mouse. It's doing the same thing as drawing in this MS Paint program. Let me undo that. So I'm going to put the mouse uh, right about here, and then while this window is still in focus, I'm going to press F5. And now you can see that Pi Auto GUI has dragged the mouse around to draw out this square spiral shape for me. That's pretty neat. Here, I'll just uh, put this program in focus again, and then press F5 to draw it out one more time. That's pretty nice. So you can see, now your Python programs can interact with other programs on your computer. This is really nice, but there is one thing that I have to warn you about. So you might be familiar with this Disney movie called Fantasia, and there's a scene in it called The Sorcerer's Apprentice where Mickey Mouse is this wizard who has is given the task of filling up this bathtub full of water, so he enchants a broom to do it for him. Now this broom is just mindlessly programmed to fill up a bucket of water and then pour it into the tub, but Mickey the wizard loses control and can't stop this broom from executing its program, and so eventually the broom starts filling up and overfilling the tub and water gets everywhere, and it's a giant mess. So a similar thing can happen with your GUI automation programs. Because while PyAuto GUI is controlling the mouse, that means that you can't use the mouse to click on, say, idle, and then press Control c or click on the close button, so you might lose control of your computer to this program. So PyAutoGUI has a failsafe installed, and this is while your program is executing, uh, every time you make a call to a PyAutoGUI function, it checks if the mouse cursor is in the top left corner at the zero, at the zero, zero coordinates, and if so, it will then raise an exception to stop the program. So if the mouse is ever moving around a lot, just try slamming the mouse up and to the left to get it into this corner. And you just need it there for a brief moment for PyAutoGUI to detect this and then stop. PyAutoGUI by default has a tenth of a second pause after every single call, so that'll give you enough time to just slam the mouse up to the upper left corner. So let me show you an example of this using the spiral drawing program. So I'm going to run this and then try to cut it off in the middle of its execution. So press F5 to start, and oh, okay, excellent. So you can see it kind of messed up the drawing right here because I was constantly trying to move the mouse cursor up to the top left corner, but once I got it there, PyAutoGUI raised this failsafe exception, and that crashed the program and stopped it. So that's much better than, you know, pulling the plug on your computer to shut it down. So moving and clicking the mouse is great, but you're first going to have to carefully figure out the coordinates for every part that you want to click on on the screen. There's an easier way to do this, but unfortunately we can't run it from idle. We'll have to actually open up a terminal. So I'm going to hit Windows key R and run the command line tool and just run Python from here. 
and import PyAuto GUI and call PyAuto GUI's display mouse position function. This is a really handy sort of mini program inside the PyAuto GUI module. What this does is it shows the real time position in the X and Y coordinates of where the mouse is, as well as the RGB, that's the red, green, blue value um, of the pixel that the mouse is currently over. So you can see I'm over black right now, so the RGB value is all zeros. But if I'm over white, it's all 255. If I'm over this green text, the red and blue are zero, but the green part is 160. So these, this tuple of integers is just, is a common way in computing to represent a specific color. But mostly you can just look right here. So say, um, oh hey, I want to click on file. So I can just move the mouse over here and then maybe just write down on paper, oh, that's at x18, y40. And then say, move this off to the side. Say after I click on file, I want to click on open and that'll be at x58 and y118. And so this really helps quicken how long it takes for you to find uh, co screen coordinates for your GUI automation program and press Control c to quit. Now unfortunately this doesn't work in idle because it has a slightly different way of drawing out text characters. You can see if you try to run it, it ends up looking a, like a giant mess. Display mouse uh, position. Yeah, that's actually not too great. So let's hit Control c to stop that. But running display mouse position from a terminal can really help speed up all of gathering all of the screen coordinates that you need. So to recap, controlling the mouse and keyboard is called GUI automation, and the PyAuto GUI third-party module has many functions to do this. Uh, PyAuto GUI's size function returns the screen resolution, position returns the mouse position, move to will move the mouse to an X, Y coordinate, and drag to will drag the mouse to that X and Y coordinate. And there's also move rel and drag rel, which moves or drags the mouse relative to its current position. These moves and drags are instantaneous, but you can pass a duration keyword argument to make it work slower and mimic what a human operator would do. PyAuto GUI also has click, double click, right click, and middle click functions to click the various mouse buttons. And if your program gets out of control, just slam the mouse cursor up to the top left and PyAuto GUI will raise that failsafe exception. And the complete documentation for PyAuto GUI is at pyautogui.readthedocs.org. Welcome to lesson 49. In the last lesson, we covered PyAuto GUI's mouse controlling functions. In this lesson, we'll cover its keyboard controlling functions. So let's start off in the interactive shell by importing PyAuto GUI. Remember that this is a third party module, so you'll have to install it with pip before you can import it. The PyAuto GUI.typewrite function sends virtual key presses to the computer. What these key presses do depends on what window and text field has focus. So you may want to first send a mouse click to the field that you want to ensure has focus. So as a simple example, I'm going to have PyAuto GUI type out hello world into this text window, but I'm going to want this to click right about here first to bring this window into focus. So there's a small trick where you can run two instructions from the same interactive shell line by separating them with a semicolon. So I'm going to first call pyautogui.click and say click at x and y of 100. So that'll be somewhere right here. And then it will call the typewrite function and type out hello world. So this will click on the file editor right here and then type out this string to that window. So I'll press enter. And you can see it instantly types out this string that we passed to typewrite. But if we want this typewriting to look more human-like, we can add in the interval keyword argument and pass it the number of seconds that PyAuto GUI will pause in between each character. So let's say I want to have a 0 0.02 seconds pause in between each character. I'm going to press enter and run this now. And you can see it types it out much more slowly with a fifth of a second pause in between each character. So typewrite is pretty good, but, but what if you have to press a key that can't really be well represented by a single 
string character, such as the shift key or the left arrow key or the control or escape or F5 key, Pi Auto GUI lets you send a list of these strings to type out. So I'm going to just copy that part so that it'll click over here to the file editor and let's pass this a list of keyboard characters to type. So let's say I wanted to type the A key, then the B key, and then press the left arrow key. So I'll just pass it the strings left twice to press the left arrow key twice. And then I'll just have it press a capital X and capital Y. Let's add an interval of one second in between each of these. So now when I press enter here, you can see AB has been pressed. And then the cursor moves to the left twice because we passed it left twice here. And then it typed out X and Y. So you can see even though AB was typed first, uh, we moved the cursor over to the left twice and then typed XY, so XY appears in front of AB. Now you can find a list of these string names inside of PyAutoGUI.keyboard underscore keys. And these are all the names of different keyboard keys you can use. So you can see there's Escape, or F11, or even things like Volume Mute and Volume Up for the volume buttons. Some of these will only work on particular operating systems. You know, there's no Windows key on Macs. And similarly, some of these have names like Shift Left for the Left Shift key, or Shift Right for the Right Shift key. It also just has plain shift if you don't care. I think usually this defaults to the left key when there's two of them. And if you only want to press a single key instead of several, you can just call the press function and pass it one of these keyboard keys. So I'm going to have PyAutoGUI press F1, which should trigger the Python docs keyboard shortcut in idle. Oh, whoops, sorry, this is lowercase. F1, as you can see here. There we go. So I'll close that. And if you ever want to do keyboard, and if you ever want to do keyboard shortcuts like Control C to copy, or maybe uh, Control O to bring up the open file uh, dialog, PyAuto GUI has the hotkey function which you can pass it a series of keys that it'll press in combination. So let's say I want to have control O pressed. You can see that engaged idles control O shortcut, which brought up this open dialog. So to recap, PyAuto GUI's virtual key presses will go to the window that currently has focus. So sometimes you might have to click on that window first. Type right can be passed a string of characters to type. It also has an interval keyword argument to introduce a pause in between each character that type. Or you can pass a list of strings to type right, and that lets you use hard to type keyboard keys like Shift or F1. And these keyboard key strings can be found in PyAutoGUI.keyboard underscore keys. The press function will press a single key if that's all you need, or the hotkey function can be used for keyboard shortcuts like Control O. Welcome to lesson 49. In the last lesson, we covered PyAuto GUI's mouse controlling functions. In this lesson, we'll cover its keyboard controlling functions. So let's start off in the interactive shell by importing PyAuto GUI. Remember that this is a third party module, so you'll have to install it with pip before you can import it. The PyAuto GUI.typewrite function sends virtual key presses to the computer. What these key presses do depends on what window and text field has focus. So you may want to first send a mouse click to the field that you want to ensure has focus. So as a simple example, I'm going to have PyAuto GUI type out hello world into this text window, but I'm going to want this to click right about here first to bring this window into focus. So there's a small trick where you can run two instructions from the same interactive shell line by separating them with a semicolon. So I'm going to first call pyautogui.click and say click at x and y of 100. So that'll be somewhere right here. 
and then it will call the typewrite function and type out hello world. So this will click on the file editor right here and then type out this string to that window. So I'll press enter and you can see it instantly types out this string that we passed to typewrite. But if we want this typewriting to look more human-like, we can add in the interval keyword argument and pass it the number of seconds that PyAutoGUI will pause in between each character. So let's say I want to have a 0 0.02 seconds pause in between each character. I'm going to press enter and run this now. And you can see it types it out much more slowly with a fifth of a second pause in between each character. So typewrite is pretty good, but, but what if you have to press a key that can't really be well represented by a single string character, such as the shift key or the left arrow key or the control or escape or F5 key? PyAutoGUI lets you send a list of these strings to type out. So I'm going to just copy that part so that it'll click over here to the file editor. And let's pass this a list of keyboard characters type. So let's say I wanted to type the A key, then the B key, and then press the left arrow key. So I'll just pass it the strings left twice to press the left arrow key twice. And then I'll just have it press a capital X and capital Y. Let's add an interval of one second in between each of these. So now, when I press enter here, you can see AB has been pressed. And then the cursor moves to the left twice because we passed it left twice here. And then it typed out X and Y. So you can see even though AB was typed first, uh, we moved the cursor over to the left twice and then typed XY, so XY appears in front of AB. Now you can find a list of these string names inside of pyautogui.keyboard underscore keys. And these are all the names of different keyboard keys you can use. So you can see there's escape or F11 or even things like volume mute and volume up for the volume buttons. Some of these will only work on particular operating systems. You know, there's no Windows key on Macs. And similarly, some of these have names like shift left for the left shift key or shift right for the right shift key. It also just has plain shift if you don't care. I think usually this defaults to the left key when there's two of them. And if you only want to press a single key instead of several, you can just call the press function and pass it one of these keyboard keys. So I'm going to have PyAutoGUI press F1, which should trigger the Python docs keyboard shortcut in idle. Oh, whoops, sorry, this is lowercase f1, as you can see here. There we go. So I'll close that. And if you ever want to do keyboard, and if you ever want to do keyboard shortcuts like control C to copy, or maybe uh, control O to bring up the open file uh, dialog. PyAutoGUI has the hotkey function, which you can pass it a series of keys that it'll press in combination. So let's say I want to have control O pressed. You can see that engaged idles control O shortcut, which brought up this open dialog. So to recap, PyAutoGUI's virtual key presses will go to the window that currently has focus, so sometimes you might have to click on that window first. TypeWrite can be passed a string of characters to type. It also has an interval keyword argument to introduce a pause in between each character that type. Or you can pass a list of strings to TypeWrite, and that lets you use hard-to-type keyboard keys like Shift or F1. And these keyboard key strings can be found in PyAutoGUI.keyboard underscore keys. The press function will press a single key if that's all you need, or the hotkey function can be used for keyboard shortcuts like Control O. Welcome to Lesson 50, which continues our coverage of GUI automation and the PyAuto GUI module. So far, we've learned how to control the mouse and the keyboard. We can make programs that control these input devices, but they do so blindly. When we call click, the program doesn't know what it's clicking on. 
we need a way to let the program see what's on the screen. PyAuto GUI has screenshot features that can create an image object based on the current contents of the screen. PyAuto GUI is installed with the Pillow imaging module to use its same image data type. Now Pillow and working with images is beyond the scope of this course, but you can learn about it from chapter 17 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Remember that PyAuto GUI is a third-party module, so you have to install it with pip. Further, on Linux computers, the Scrot program needs to be installed to use the screenshot functions in PyAuto GUI. In a terminal window, run sudo apt-get install scrot to install this program. If you're on Windows or OS X, you don't need to do anything more beyond installing PyAuto GUI with pip. So to take screenshots in Python, call the pyautogui.screenshot function. This will return a pillow image object, and you can call any method on this image object that's described in the pillow documentation. Chapter 17 covers these methods and the image objects, but for our purposes, we just want to pass the screenshot function a file name, such as screenshotexample.png. So this will take a screenshot and also save it to an image file on the hard drive. So I'll just go ahead and take a look at this image file. And there we go. Here's an image of the contents of the screen. This is kind of meta looking. So you can see how PyAutoGUI can now quote unquote see what's on the screen. But in order to do image recognition, we'll have to call the locate on screen function. Locate on screen. And we pass it an image that we want it to find on the screen. So for example, I have this calculator program right here, and it has a whole bunch of buttons on it. And so say I took a screenshot earlier with the calculator window open, and then I cropped it so that just the seven button was in the image. And I had something like this. I stored this in a file called calc7key.png. I can now call the locate on screen function and pass it the file name of this calc7key.png, and this will return the xy coordinates of where on the screen it can find that, that 7 key image that looked like this. So when I press enter, you can see it's returned a tuple of four integers. This is the x and y coordinates of where on the screen it found that 7 key right here. It's so the top left region of that image. And here is the width and height of that region. That's the width and height of this image that we were looking for right here. So a bit more useful is calling the locate center on screen function. And this will just return the X, Y coordinates of the center of that region. So right here in the center of the seven key, I can pass this to say the pi auto GUI uh, move to function. I'll just have it move there with a duration of one second. And you can see the mouse moves right here to that X, Y coordinates. And then maybe later I can have it just click at those coordinates. Note that, click func note that the click function can take a single tuple value with the two x and y integers, or we can simply just pass it two integer values separately, and they both do the same thing. Now there's two things that you should know about these locate functions. One is that they're fairly computationally expensive. Depending on the size of your screen, it could take up to a full second to execute this function. So you really can't use it for, say, real-time games where the screen is constantly updating. And second, these image matches have to be pixel perfect. Every single pixel color here in the sample image that we pass it has to match the screen in order for this to be able to find it. Now you can check out the PyAuto GUI documentation at pyautogui.readthedocs.org for ways to speed up the locate functions and also have them do partial matches but by default, 
this is going to be kind of slow and it has to be pixel perfect. So let's say that we had this calculator function uh, slightly covered up. I'm going to open up a file editor window and just use it to slightly cover up that 7 key. Now when we try to find it on the screen, we're going to find that PyAuto GUI can't find it. So this locate center on screen function is going to return the none value. Even still, you can do some pretty cool things now that you have a way of reading the screen and also controlling the mouse and keyboard using PyAuto GUI. And one thing that I'm going to show you is a bot that I wrote that will automatically play this flash game, Sushi Go Round. So Sushi Go Round is a pretty typical flash game. You have these customers that arrive and they have orders and you have to click on the ingredients for a particular sushi and then uh, serve this up to them and then order more ingredients from a phone. This is basically just a bunch of image recognition and then clicking on the correct things. And I've written a bot that can do all of this automatically. Let's go ahead and do a live demo of this bot. So from right now, the script is going to control the keyboard and mouse entirely for me, beginning right now. You can see that PyAutoGUI has used image recognition to find all those buttons that it should click on. And now as customers arrive and they order different types of sushi, I'm using image recognition to figure out what they're ordering and then clicking on these buttons and the bot is doing all of this automatically. You can see the mouse cursor is moving fairly precisely. Now this bot can't play this game perfectly and there's still some bugs that I'm working out, but this bot plays Sushi Go Round much better than I can just on my own. And whenever I want to stop this bot, I can go ahead and just slam the mouse to the top left corner and that failsafe exception will be raised and that will halt the program. This way I can get the mouse control back into my hands. If you want to take a look at the source code for this Sushi Go Round bot, you can find it on my GitHub page at github.com slash aswigert slash Sushi Go Round bot. But this is just a demonstration of a pretty awesome thing that you can do with GUI automation. So to recap, a screenshot is an image of the screen's content. The PyAuto GUI screenshot function will return an image object of the screen, or you can pass it a file name and save that screenshot to an image file. And the locate on screen and locate center on screen functions will be passed a sample image value and return the coordinates of where it can find that image currently on the screen. If it can't find it on the screen, these functions will return none. And finally, you can combine all of the keyboard and mouse control functions with reading the screen and create some pretty cool things like that Sushi Go Round bot. Welcome to Lesson 50, which continues our coverage of GUI automation and the PyAuto GUI module. So far, we've learned how to control the mouse and the keyboard. We can make programs that control these input devices, but they do so blindly. When we call click, the program doesn't know what it's clicking on. We need a way to let the program see what's on the screen. PyAuto GUI has screenshot features that can create an image object based on the current contents of the screen. PyAuto GUI is installed with the Pillow imaging module to use its same image data type. Now Pillow and working with images is beyond the scope of this course, but you can learn about it from chapter 17 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Remember that PyAuto GUI is a third-party module, so you have to install it with pip. Further, on Linux computers, the Scrot program needs to be installed to use the screenshot functions in PyAuto GUI. In a terminal window, run sudo apt-get install scrot to install this program. If you're on Windows or OS X, you don't need to do anything more beyond installing PyAuto GUI with pip. So to take screenshots in Python, call the pyautogui.screenshot function. This will return a pillow image object, and you can call any method on this image object that's described in the pillow documentation. Chapter 17 covers these methods and the image objects. But for our purposes, we just want to pass the screenshot function a file name, such as screenshotexample.png. So this will take a screenshot and also save it to an image file on the hard drive. So I'll just go ahead and take a look at this image file. And there we go. Here's an image of the contents of the screen. This is kind of meta looking. So you can see how PyAutoGUI can now 
quote unquote, see what's on the screen. But in order to do image recognition, we'll have to call the locate on screen function. Locate on screen, and we pass it an image that we want it to find on the screen. So for example, I have this calculator program right here, and it has a whole bunch of buttons on it. And so say I took a screenshot earlier with the calculator window open, and then I cropped it so that just the seven button was in the image. And I had something like this. I stored this in a file called calc7key.png. I can now call the locate on screen function and pass it the file name of this calc7key.png and this will return the xy coordinates of where on the screen it can find that that seven key image that looked like this so when i press enter you can see it's returned a tuple of four integers this is the x and y coordinates of where on the screen it found that seven key right here and it's the top left region of that image. And here is the width and height of that region. That's the width and height of this image that we were looking for right here. So a bit more useful is calling the locate center on screen function. And this will just return the X, Y coordinates of the center of that region. So right here in the center of the seven key, I can pass this to say the pi auto GUI uh, move to function. I'll just have it move there with a duration of one second. And you can see the mouse moves right here to that X, Y coordinates. And then maybe later I can have it just click at those coordinates. Note that, click func note that the click function can take a single tuple value with the two X and Y integers, or we can simply just pass it two integer values separately, and they both do the same thing. Now there's two things that you should know about these locate functions. One is that they're fairly computationally expensive. Depending on the size of your screen, it could take up to a full second to execute this function. So you really can't use it for, say, real-time games where the screen is constantly updating. And second, these image matches have to be pixel perfect. Every single pixel color here in the sample image that we pass it has to match the screen in order for this to be able to find it. Now you can check out the PyAutoGUI documentation at pyautogui.readthedocs.org for ways to speed up the locate functions and also have them do partial matches. But by default, this is going to be kind of slow and it has to be pixel perfect. So let's say that we had this calculator function uh, slightly covered up. I'm going to open up a file editor window and just use it to slightly cover up that seven key. Now when we try to find it on the screen, we're going to find that PyAutoGUI can't find it. So this locate center on screen function is going to return the none value. Even still, you can do some pretty cool things now that you have a way of reading the screen and also controlling the mouse and keyboard using PyAutoGUI. And one thing that I'm going to show you is a bot that I wrote that will automatically play this flash game Sushi Go Round. So Sushi Go Round is a pretty typical flash game. You have these customers that arrive and they have orders and you have to click on the ingredients for a particular sushi and then uh, serve this up to them and then order more ingredients from a phone. This is basically just a bunch of image recognition and then clicking on the correct things. And I've written a bot that can do all of this automatically. Let's go ahead and do a live demo of this bot. So from right now, the script is going to control the keyboard and mouse entirely for me beginning right now. You can see that PyAutoGUI has used image recognition to find all those buttons that it should click on. And now as customers arrive and they order different types of sushi, I'm using image recognition to figure out what they're ordering and then clicking on these buttons 
and the bot is doing all of this automatically. You can see the mouse cursor is moving fairly precisely. Now this bot can't play this game perfectly and there's still some bugs that I'm working out, but this bot plays Sushi Go Round much better than I can just on my own. And whenever I want to stop this bot, I can go ahead and just slam the mouse to the top left corner and that failsafe exception will be raised and that will halt the program. This way I can get the mouse control back into my hands. If you want to take a look at the source code for this Sushi Go Round bot, you can find it on my GitHub page at github.com slash aswigert slash sushi go round bot. But this is just a demonstration of a pretty awesome thing that you can do with GUI automation. So to recap, a screenshot is an image of the screen's content. The PyAuto GUI screenshot function will return an image object of the screen, or you can pass it a file name and save that screenshot to an image file. And the locate on screen and locate center on screen functions will be passed a sample image value and return the coordinates of where it can find that image currently on the screen. If it can't find it on the screen, these functions will return none. And finally, you can combine all of the keyboard and mouse control functions with reading the screen and create some pretty cool things like that sushi go round bot. Congratulations! Thanks for making it to the end. At this point, you can go out and get a six-figure software developer job in Silicon Valley, right? Well, not quite. The ocean of programming is both very deep and very wide. There is always more to learn, even if you've been programming for years. The good news, though, is that no matter what your current profession is now, you'll be able to do that job better. If you're an accountant, you're now an accountant who can code. If you're an academic, you're now an academic who can code. If you're a sales rep, you're now a sales rep who can code. If you're a coder, you're now a coder who can code. More. Personal computers are tools used in almost every desk job, and quite a few other jobs too. By learning to write simple programs to automate tasks, you're in a much better position to fully utilize that tool. But hey, if you want to become a six-figure making software developer, You'll just have to keep learning and practicing, just as you've been doing for this course. You don't necessarily have to spend four years getting a computer science degree, and it's not about being a super genius programmer. To become a software engineer, you just need to keep learning new things. Python is incredibly versatile, and there's much more to it to learn. Thanks again for taking this course, and good luck!